your outrage and your outpouring of support. So please, again, go to our website to check out all of the media and all the coverage and all the ways in which this campaign has won. But because of you, we can continue to push back. So right now, as you see on the screen, tag somebody right now, take out your phones, Tell them um, to sign up at tinyurl.com, H-O-U, Fallen Warriors, and tell them to go to handsoffuhuru.org slash events and to register for today's event. Um, we are, you know, we are on multiple platforms right now, so continue to share, share, but get them here in the Zoom so we continue to have this discussion. So I'm just going to give like about 10 seconds for everybody who has had a chance to share, tell us that you shared this event. And if not, you have about 10 seconds to put in the chat right now that I'm sharing, I will share. Let us know that you are getting this out in the world. Uhuru. All right, next slide. So thank you, comrade. So you saw the video, you saw what happened on July 29th. Uh, you know, on July 29th, the US government attacked the African People's Socialist Party with a violent FBI raid on seven offices and homes of the um, African People's Socialist Party and the Uhura movement, including leaders, um, you know, including the chairman, Omali Yeshatela and deputy chair Onazune Yeshatela um, in St. Louis, the, the Uhura House in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Uhura Solidarity Center in St. Louis on the north side in the white community, and as well as the homes of other members of the movement and Lord Director Akile, um, who leads our media and communications for the African Pe People's Socialist Party out of her home under false pretense and saying her, her car was being, being broken into only to surround her with a gang of FBI agents. So again, the chairman and many of our leaders were handcuffed with assault rifles pointing at the chairman's chest. This was an assassination attempt. We should make no question about that, no doubt about that. And the FBI used flashbang grenades, drones, battering rams, breaking down doors, windows, stealing property property, computers, and again, as you saw in that video, hiding and covering up security cameras to, to cover up their, their, their destruction and their theft. Four members of our movement were named as quote-unquote unindicted co-conspirators and um, on this attack. And today we are here to continue to push back because everybody who stands against the U.S. government, who has, you know, who has, who, who disagrees with the ways in which this nation, this, this country and the U.S. government and, and its allies continue to wage war on African people and oppressed pe peoples of the world should see yourself too as the unindicted co-conspirator because we have to take a stand right now in this moment. Thank you, comrade. Next slide. And we want to let everybody know that even before July 29th, the attacks on the African People's Socialist Party began on July 2nd, when somebody came out of their car in broad daylight with a military style flamethrower and torched the African flag, the red, black and green flag waving outside of the Uhura House in St. Pete. We're going to take a quick moment to just look at this video. This is the first attack. Developing out of St. Petersburg right now, the search is on for a man caught on camera using a flamethrower to torch an African flag. You're seeing some of that video right here. You can see that flamethrower right there over in the corner and that being the African flag. This happened this weekend at the Yahuru House. Ten Tampa Bay's Megan Myers spoke with members there today as they say they were targeted for their beliefs. The African People's Socialist Party says that a nearby neighbor who witnessed the incident tried to stop the man from fleeing this parking lot. Our connection to this community was clear on Saturday when someone tried to prevent the arsonist from escaping the parking lot. Akile NIE says this building has been a long-standing community center for the organization to hold meetings and events. She says the basis of this weekend's attack is clear. This was a targeted, ideologically informed attack. The surveillance video shows a man pulling up in a white car, sitting inside for a few minutes, and then getting out a large flamethrower from his trunk. Jamie Simpson says it was an attempt to intimidate the African community. No one can stop the African working class from organizing in their own interests to free themselves. Leaders of the organization want this to be looked at as an arson case. But St. Pete police say it's being considered criminal mischief because of the low monetary value of the damage. The group says they're confident they'll be able to track down the person responsible. Clearly it was politically motivated, a very ideological kind of attack. If you have any information about this incident, you are asked to contact police. I'm reporting in St. Pete, Megan Myers, 10 Tampa Bay.
Thank you, Megan. And we did ask St. Pete, Pol Pete Police if they're looking at this as a possible hate crime. They say to be a hate crime, there has to be a reference to race, religion, sexuality, and there was none of that. They add that this is the early stage of the investigation, and it is possible that a hate crime charge could be added later if deemed necessary. Uhuru. So as we said, that happened on July 2nd. And as you know, 27 days later on July 29th, the, uh, the African People's Socialist Party was attacked. Next slide. And then in September, September 2022, a petition that had been circulating from the African People's Socialist Party through um, one of our mass organizations in PEDEM had over 130,000 signatures that were wiped clean from change.org. So that's that's another attack. Then as we move to October, October 31st, a member of our movement was um uh was was unlawfully arrested by um you know by the by the feds, you know, on some false charges for making terroristic threats, only to find out that this was another attempt by the state to to try to neutralize and to cause division within our movement. Next slide. Then on December 2022, we 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 learn of the threats of pending indictments of our un, of our quote unquote unindicted co-conspirators plus others, many others in early 2023, and that's why we are again here today. And again on January 7th, um, a a building, a beautiful church building in the um, on the north side of St. Louis that the that the African People's Socialist Party was in the process of purchasing this this church in the impoverished community of North North St. Louis was torched uh, days you know days later this agreement so there's another attack right there and you can see this inferno right across the street from um, from where members of our movement live. And, and recently, just a few weeks ago, on July, uh, on Jan February 14th, um, APDF, one of our nonprofits, had applied for a grant and was approved for a $36,000 grant for small equipment and other improvements of our station, and only to find out that the, Pelena, that the Pinellas County during a private working meeting, agreed to not well, agreed to not only not fund this, but then to revoke and to rescind this grant. And you can, um, we will link later on in the chat for you the press conference, which is which was our fight back that we had last week to to denounce and to put the hand and the power back into the black community. So when you when you donate and when you support to the Hands Off Who Hands Off Africa Defense Campaign, you unite with our basic principles of unity. You want to understand that this is being led by the African People's Socialist Party, but that on the most basic level, you denounce the FBI and the U.S. government for their attacks on the African liberation movement. And you demand that that the U.S. government drop all threats, that they return all confiscated property that and we demand an end to FBI surveillance on the and infiltration of the of the Uhura movement and deny announce the assault on the anti-colonial activity and programs of the African People's Socialist Party. Next slide. So as we say, and as the chairman has said, we are not retreating, we are building. And we're gonna let you know more that you can do and you're gonna learn about how you can help us build on today's event. Uh, tonight, you will learn more about how you can help us reach our 270,000, um, get to our $277,000 goal. Um, as you can see here on the screen or on the next screen, you're going to see many things that we will talk about today. But one thing that you can do right now, if you have not done already, is to sign the emergency response pledge so that you can receive notifications um, and or urgent action you know, alerts as soon as um, this emergency response is mobilized. If you haven't done this, do it right now. Go to handsoffuhuru.org, click the emergency response tab, and look out this week for a test email so we can go ahead and start to mobilize. Uhuru. So um, again, everyone, as you know, we are here to put out this political analysis, which has which is truly shaping the world as it is, but we want you to donate. So if you have not donated already, go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate um, on today, because as you can see um, on the next slide, you will see that your donations have helped to fuel nonstop press tours. Um, and you know your, your contributions have helped to get Chairman Amalia Shetela and others out into the world on these speaking engagements and different media outlets. You will, we also want to give a shout out and a special thank you to M1 of Dead Prez for helping to spread the word about the July 29 attacks, as you can see on his Instagram page, and his support for the Uhura movement since day one and the fight back. And you can get one of those t-shirts or, or, or sweatshirts that you see M1 wearing, and we'll talk more about that in our announcements and our appeal. Also, again, 
so many interviews to mention. There are too many to mention. So we want you to go to handsoffwhohoo.org, um, go to our you know uh, news uh, button, and and you can see some of the media coverage that has been um, you know taking place and that's constantly being updated. So we just want to appreciate um, all the different media outlets who have supported. And finally, again, we are going to make our goal today. Today, we have a goal of raising $2,000. We want to get past the $160,000 milestone, and we're going to do that today. So I want to appreciate everybody for being here today, because as we say, we are not retreating. We are building, comrades. And as we, as it's been said, we are going to put the state on trial. So what I want to um, do is we're going to transition um, and I'm going to invite up Director Akile, who's going to give a presentation. But it is important to know that right now, the crisis of imperialism is being revealed. You can look in colonial news and journals in the Washington Post and the New York Times articles that are explaining exactly what the chairman has been putting forth for years, over 50 years, which is why we are, which is why the party was attacked, saying that there is this global divide and that this whole, you know, attempt to isolate Russia didn't work. But this has been what the chairman has been saying for years, everyone, and we know that. And so we want to just let everyone know that the party is leading and the African People's Socialist Party will continue to fight back so that Africa can can be redeemed and Africa can can return back to its um, to its state as as powerful in power or self-determined people. So I'm going to invite up Director Akile, who's going to give us a uh, lead us through a presentation. Um, a slideshow with, um, you know, laying out the theme of today, because today is about the African martyr. We want to support, um, well, we want to appreciate and honor and look at the historical attack on African people fighting back for our liberation and for our freedom. So I want to thank you, comrades, for um, for sticking with us. And thank you for those who have shared so far, who have made donations. We look forward to continuing to, um, you know, let you know that we see you. And um I see you on here, Director Akile. I think I do. There you are, comrade. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you, comrade. Oh, all right, Uhuru, uh, Chair Mwesi, thank you so much for just that incredible overview, that's introduction, like just blasting it open just to say what this whole discussion is about, um, what it is that we're trying to do and to mobilize everyone, you know, participating in this discussion to support the Hands Off Uhuru campaign and especially to donate um, to the Legal Defense Fund, um, helping us break that $160,000 mark on today. So I just want to echo that call and um, get into the uh, a presentation that really highlights the theme of this discussion, um, which is long live our uh, fallen warriors um, and a salute to our African martyrs. So <clears throat> uh, we can go to the next slide. So first and uh, foremost, we want to recognize the leadership of Chairman Amalia Shatella as Chair Mwazi just laid out. You know, we see um, the the whole theory and leadership of the chairman and the theory of African internationalism coming back to us from all different um, uh, types of sources. And, you know, we had the on display just a moment ago uh, from the Washington Post and the New York Times, this analysis that, you know, as stated, the chairman has been putting out for 50 years to define the fundamental contradiction of uh, plaguing African people and plaguing the entire world as one uh, um, uh, of colonialism and the colonial mode of production that locked the whole world into um, the same uh, process. And so we see this same analysis coming back and in, and in, in specifically the analysis around the uh the war of uh, the so-called russia ukraine war which is really uh as chairman put it out at, right out of the gate it's a defensive war that russia is waging against the colonial powers and the colonial powers of the world are using ukraine as the vehicle uh to attack russia and the chairman was the first person to really put that out and to explain it that way. And now we see, you know, this uh, being um, uh, understood and reinforced, uh, you know, throughout the world in terms of, you know, how it's being articulated, how this whole thing is uh, being understood as, a you know, just a desperate attempt by these colonial powers to maintain their death grip on the rest of us. And so we have to recognize the leadership of the chairman and the theory of African internationalism in this process. And it's also um, something we should recognize as part of the reason why they would try to make Chairman Amalia Shatella an African martyr on July 29th when they appointed assault, assault rifles at his chest coming out of his home, and also how they're trying to put him in prison and take him out of the revolutionary struggle um, and to, you know, essentially, you know, um, make him carry out 
the rest of his life behind bars. So this is what we, we've called it uh, to stop the legal lynching of Chairman Amalia Chatella because it's clear what their strategy is, what they what they intend to do um, as a part of trying to crush this uh, movement and crush the struggle of African people to be free. Of course, they will not be successful and that's why we're here today. But just to say that uh, what Chairman Amalia Chatella has done with the theory of African internationalism to set our whole history on the right course this is why he would um, you know, be attacked and targeted in the way that he has. So I just wanna say salute to Chairman Amalia Chatella. Uhuru. So the first Congress of the African People's Socialist Party in 1981 adopted the Day of the African Martyr on February 21st annually. So since um, the adoption, the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement has celebrated African Martyrs Day on February 21st, which is the day, I believe, of the assassination of Malcolm X. And so obviously very significant uh, to raise up uh, Malcolm X, but the whole question of the African martyr, uh, which we're going to be talking about, what is an African martyr and why is this significant? So next. So to, this day is dedicated to our fallen heroes who gave their lives for African freedom and independence all around the world. February 21st, the day of the assassination of Malcolm X. So this, um, uh, the context around the discussion we're having around African martyrs, of course, has to be placed uh, right now in terms of the attack that was made on the chairman, on the party in the Uhuru movement on July 29, 2022. The same reason why, you know, these leaders of our movement historically were attacked, were killed, were targeted, um, was because of the work that they were doing to free African people, to free our people from, you know, this whole uh, colonial mode of production that has wreaked havoc and misery against our people for 600 years. And so it's because of that struggle, a just struggle where uh, a people have been oppressed and colonized and, and, you know, everything has been stolen from them, stripped from them and live in the most horrendous conditions you can find throughout the whole world, Africans living like this. And so the, you know, the, the most logical thing for do, uh, to do as an African is to struggle against those conditions. And so every time Black people have organized to struggle to be free, to struggle to be from up under this social system, we have come under attack. And July 29th is no different than the historic attacks that have been carried out against our leaders and against our movements past. Um, uh, to prevent Black people from being able to achieve our freedom and independence. So the chairman and the party, we were attacked because of the 50-year fight for the total liberation of Africa and African people everywhere. And that has to be the thing that is clearly understood about who the African People's Socialist Party is and why this organization would be attacked, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this time. And it's not the first time that the party has come under attack. It has you know, always been, you know, uh, facing some uh, form of colonial state intervention, you know, trying to prevent this organization from doing what it has been successful in doing for over 50 years. Um, but we have to understand that it's that history and it's that struggle um, it, that informs our understanding of why the FBI would attack this organization today. <clears throat> So African people have always resisted the colonial assault on our people in Africa and abroad. So there's never been a point in our history for the last 600 years where we have just surrendered to you know, our oppression and to the colonizer, that there has always been somebody who uh, has fought you know, to struggle, to fight, uh, fight to free African people has always happened um, from, the, from the point of being snatched up from the continent and being placed on ships and being brought you know, to uh, various types of places all throughout the world, Africans have never stopped fighting. And that must be very clearly understood. We have never needed somebody to tell us that we are oppressed. We have never needed somebody to tell us that we need to struggle against our oppression because please believe as soon as Africans came um, into contact with the colonizer and, you know, and as they you know, carried out this assault on our land and our people, this is something that Africans have uh, been struggling against, have never, ever, ever laid down and accepted of this reality. <clears throat> African people were kidnapped and forcibly dispersed around the world, building wealth, prosperity for Europe and white people. And, and everywhere it is that the colonizer finds themselves throughout the world, the reason why you know, they're there and have you know, access to the wealth and the resources that they do is because of what happened to African people when we were kidnapped and forcibly dispersed. African people's stolen resources and labor create life for the white colonizers. 
And so wherever we've been forcibly dispersed, we are colonized as one African nation. We are one people. And this is why when you look throughout the world, the conditions of our people are exactly the same because it's the same contradiction. It's the same colonizer that uh, uh, forced us throughout the world and then called us all uh, by these different names in order to support their aims, their interests. And But we have to recognize that we are part of one uh, uh, forcibly dispersed um, African nation. And, you know, this is why everywhere that Africans are, you see us struggling against these conditions. So just really important to recognize that we are not, you know, this minority population uh, here within the confines of the U.S. or any place else that we've been dispersed. We are a part of this whole African nation connected to one another making this struggle. We have fought the colonial mode of, of production built on our stolen labor, our resources, and blood. The African People's Socialist Party leads the struggle for African liberation until victory. And again, I cannot stress this enough. This explains why the FBI attacked the African People's Socialist Party. So we are going to be saluting 600 years of African martyrs who have always fiercely resisted European colonial invasion. And we're just going to be taking a look at some, this is not a full extent, but these are some, you know, of uh, uh, some of the instances of, you know, African martyrs throughout our history. And so we can see how African people have never let up against the struggle against colonialism. And so we have the Beha people of Sudan resisted European invasion since Roman times. Queen Nzinga in the 1960s led armies to fight the Portuguese assault on Angola. We have Queen Mother Ya Asantua of Ghana was a powerful resistance leader in Ghana from 1840 to 1921. The Zulu people of Southern Africa built an army of 20,000 and powerfully fought the British colonizers for a hundred years. In the Caribbean, the Maroons resisted enslavement and set up African liberated territory. The Maroon Wars of Jamaica lasted from 1655 to 1738. In Brazil in the 1600s, resistance leader Zumbi led wars and won liberated territory for African people. On the island of Guadeloupe, the resistance fighter Solitude led the fight against the French colonial army while she was pregnant. She was hanged by the French after she had her baby. She is revered as an African martyr in the Caribbean. And of course, the victorious African Revolution of Haiti from 1791 to 1804, the first successful workers' revolution in the world was that which occurred in Haiti. In Haiti, our African martyrs Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint Louverture were both assassinated by the colonizers. And a little bit about the African Revolution of Haiti, of Haiti and the victory in 1804, the victorious Haitian Revolution defeated Napoleon's imperialist army, the strongest army of its time, and established the first liberated African state and first worker state in the world. In liberated Haiti, slavery was abolished by an African government. African and oppressed peoples from anywhere in the world were given safe haven in Haiti, and white people were prohibited from owning land. Over the years, Haiti was brutally attacked by the French and US imperialism, which forced Haiti to pay $90 million in pure gold um, to France. And it's something we understand that Haiti is still being punished for today. The success of the African revolution of IET is you know, why um, uh, Haiti experiences the conditions that it does today. So just to you know, point that out. And then we have Gabriel who led a rebellion in Virginia in 1800, inspired by the Haitian revolution, he worked to raise an army of a thousand African people. And um, we also have in 1822, Telemach or Denmark Vesey led an uprising in South Carolina, also inspired by the Haiti Revolution. And Telemach is an African martyr. And also just to say how influential, you know, the African Revolution of Haiti was. I mean, it, it's it's gone to influence, you know, whole world struggles and revolutions that we've seen. Um, uh, you know, throughout history. I mean, the, the Haitian Revolution was such a critical moment, you know, in the, in the whole struggle to overturn the colonial mode of production. Our great African martyr, Nat Turner, in 1831, he led a powerful rebellion in Virginia with the slogan, strike at night and spare no one. In Africa, the Kenyan land and freedom 
Party, the Mau Mau from 1952 to 1960 fought against British colonialism. Led by our African martyr, Dedan Kimati, the Mau Mau army and the Kikuyu people were rounded up, tortured and murdered by the British. Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana in the 1960s fought for one united socialist Africa. African martyr Patrice Lumumba, first leader of independent Congo in 1960. Patrice Lumumba stood up to the Belgians and was kidnapped, tortured, assassinated by the US and Belgian forces. The African revolution in Azania, what is referred to uh, as South Africa today, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe and the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. Our African martyr on the Azanian front, Steve Biko, murdered by the colonizers. Amilcar Cabral, African martyr of Guinea-Bissau. Thomas Sankara in the struggle in Burkina Faso, African martyr Sankara was assassinated on October 15, 1987. We have Muammar Gaddafi in Libya assassinated by the US government in 2011. Salute our African martyr, Marcus Garvey and the UNIA from 1916 to 1940. Marcus Garvey movement was, you know, one of the largest movements of African people you would see in history. And we have the Convention of the Negro People of the World in New York in 1920. And the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, was an organization of 11 million Africans throughout the world, recognized, you know, under the slogan, uh, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. The Garvey movement built independent African institutions, such as the Black Star Line and the Negro World Newspaper. An African martyr, Garvey was targeted by the FBI with bogus charges of mail fraud. He was put in federal prison, then deported and died when he was only 56. In 2017, then President Obama refused to pardon Garvey. So we see, first of all, the FBI being used as a tool to stop the ability of African people to be able to uh, struggle for our own freedom and work in our own interests. So we see the FBI as you know, in this early, um, you know, this early in the 1900s, you know, uh, intervening in that process, then Garvey put in federal prison on these, you know, like fraudulent charges. And this is exactly what's happening to the chairman and the Uhuru movement in 20, um, in, you know, in this uh, period. And, uh, and then we also have, you know, this uh, evidence of, you know, neocolonialism, the selloutism um, in the form of Barack Hussein Obama, who refused to pardon Garvey as it states here. So we have the US front of the African revolution of the 1960s. So we've gone around the world and now we're in the US um, with Malcolm X, our great African martyr of the 1960s in the US, the instigator of the urban anti-colonial black power movement. He was assassinated by the US government on February 21st, 1965. Malcolm X brought the anti-colonial struggle of African people in the US to the world stage. African martyr Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated by the U.S. government on April 4th, 1968. African martyrs Fred Hampton and Mark Clark assassinated by the U.S. government on December 4th, 1969. They came into Fred Hampton's home at four o'clock in the morning in Chicago, just like they came to the chairman's home at five o'clock in the morning in St. Louis, Missouri. Same tactics. African martyr Huey P. Newton, leader of the Black Panther Party, assassinated August 22nd, 1989. And we also have the African prisoners of war in the U.S. And this is just another, you know, form uh, of, of ways. And as we're seeing with, you know, uh, the state trying to put this movement and the chairman on trial, that this is one form of an attempt of uh, a, a political assassination of our leaders. And the fact that they hold Africans who were struggling in the Black Power movement of the 1960s, and they're holding them into prison today, waiting for them to die. This is the this is what we're talking about in terms of why we have this urgent, this fight back is extremely urgent, why we say that the uh, the, the attempt to imprison the chairman of Malia Shetela is a death sentence. This is why we're saying that, because we see this history of taking out African leaders 
by throwing them into prison, locking them up and holding them there, you know, for decades, taking them out of the struggle and, you know, putting them in the worst kinds of conditions as punishment for struggling in the interests of African people. So we cannot forget our African prisoners of war in the U.S. Chairman Amalia Shetela took down the racist mural in St. Petersburg, December 15th, 1966. This was the first act of black power in this country and he was sentenced to five years in prison. Chairman Amalia Shetela founded the African People's Socialist Party in May on African Liberation Day in May of 1972. The chairman founded the African Socialist International to bring, as we talked about, African people are part of one globally uh, dispersed African nation. And the African Socialist International was part of the efforts to bring the whole nation together to a united struggle. And we have here Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, who heads up this work of the African Socialist International, uniting and building um, the African People Socialist Party, you know, throughout throughout Europe, the continent of Africa, and in various places where we've been dispersed. And the African People's Socialist Party, like Garvey, is building the power to govern, and we have the Black Power Blueprint. And what we have done with the Black Power Blueprint and the 50, over 50 economic institutions that we have in the Uhuru movement, not just, not just in St. Louis, but in various places, that this is the work that Marcus Garvey set out to do to be able to create dual and contending power for African people to be able to feed, clothe, and house ourselves because this was recognized as a really critical step to severing the dependence that we have on the colonizer themselves to, to eliminate the relevancy of the colonizer in our lives by being able to do for self. That's what the Black Power Blueprint is all about. That's what the African People's Socialist Party is building, the power to govern, to feed, clothe, and house ourselves, to produce and reproduce life for ourselves in our own interest. And again, this explains why the FBI attacked the chairman and this organization on July 29th. The chairman and the party have always fought for the African revolution for 50, for more than 50 years. The chairman has been involved in this struggle for the majority of his life, 60 years or more, the chairman has been advancing, you know, the, the struggle for freedom and the liberation of Africa and African people. This is why the party was attacked by the FBI on bogus allegations of being under, quote unquote, uh, the influence of Russian agents. I mean, this is, we just talked about this history. This is why it's insulting because they never needed a Russian to attack black people for struggling for freedom. And we've just laid this out historically, this is what the colonizer has done. Militarily, they've come in, they've tortured African people, killed us in the most, you know, inhum in, in just the most inhumane ways that you can possibly think of to make examples out of these leaders to say, this is what will happen to you if you dare to struggle in your own interest. So, you know, this has never required um, a, a Russian or anybody else at the US at any point in time has ever contended with. They have had a, a problem with African people ourselves being able to, first of all, come to the conclusions about our conditions and then to be able to struggle against them. This has always been something that has been a threat uh, to the U.S. government and this whole social system. So this, you know, this whole history of the African martyr and the history of the party can totally knock out on its own the allegations uh, uh, that, you know, have um, uh, come from the FBI against this movement. The party has built the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa defense campaign which is going, it's an international campaign, as we'll uh, point out with some of the panelists on today, to extend this struggle all around the world. Because uh, obviously, as those articles indicate from the Washington Post and the New York Times, and as the chairman been saying, this is something that impacts the whole world. And everywhere you see, there are colonized and oppressed people fighting back. And the Hands Off Peru, Hands Off Africa defense campaign is uniting all of these forces to be able to defend the Black liberation movement in the form of the African People's Socialist Party. And the Uhuru Four unindicted co-conspirators, as already stated, the chairman is the primary target for this attack. And they've attacked me as well as Penny Hess, the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and Jesse Neville, the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, who um, these organizations is part of the strategic front of the African People's Socialist Party, 
under the leadership of the African working class to go into the colonizer population, to fracture the unity of the colonizer population, to win them to their interests in the struggle for African liberation and for reparations to African people. So this obviously powerful strategy that required them to not only go into North side St. Louis and South side St. Pete, historically African communities, but having to go into the white community to also make this same attack. That says something about the significance of the work in, uh, of the party and the Uhuru movement and the leadership that has been provided that they have to, um, to do both of those things. So we understand, you know, it's very clear why, you know, these individuals are part of the, um, the uh, are targeted as part of the attack. But of course, the whole Uhuru movement, you know, has been opened up to this attack as well. So I'm going to close out by saying one Africa one nation, hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. This is, you know, why we're expressing the significance of hands off Africa, because this is what we recognize, that this attack that was made on our movement is an attack on the right of African people to be able to unite around the world, to struggle in our own interests, to struggle to be free. And, you know, we will not stand for it. And this is something that we're calling on you uh, to, to be engaged in as well. When we talk about raising up our African martyrs, Part of the struggle is, is to create a situation where they don't get to make any more African martyrs out of us, that we can, you know, uh, push them back, we can defeat them, and, you know, we can win this, and we are winning, uh, comrades, brothers, and sisters. So long live our African martyrs, our fallen uh, warriors, and hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa, hands off Chairman Amalia Shatella, Uhuru. Uhuru. Wow, who are Director Akile? Um, I just really want to appreciate you for that overview. And as you said, this is not this does not include everyone, right? This is just a glimpse of what this um, of of what the colonial attack has been on, on the African liberation struggle and on any type of anti-colonial activity led by the African working class. Because that, that's who you see there, organizing the African working class. And this is why the African Pe People's Socialist Party came under attack under this strategy that has always centered the African working class and will continue to fight until the end. And I want to read a um, just one comment that was in the chat um, by Karmad Farrow that says, no matter how hard colonialism tries, it can't stop us now. We will force forward and fight the African revolution until we liberate Africa and African people everywhere from colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, the struggle continues until victory is won. So I just want to say I unite. And if you unite um, to this call, again, we ask you to go to handsoffuhu.org slash donate, become a donor, continue to donate, Share share how people can continue to support this fight back. We have a wonderful program coming up for you next, which I'm going to start to introduce some of our panelists. But again, um, just to reiterate on today, um, which you might have seen in the chat already, but we have a really powerful um, group of presentations today. We will begin by a presentation by uh, Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, who's Secretary of the African Socialist International. We also have with us today um, Tafari Mugeri, who is the chair of the African People's Socialist Party in Occupy um, Azania. We also have very special guest Jalil Muntakim, um, comrade brother, um, who is a political prisoner and who has continued to fight and a former Black Panther Party member. And we have Chairman Amalia Chatello, who will give us a, a special presentation as well today. So we are going to get right into our, um, our speakers. I want to um, go ahead and invite up Louise Kinshasa, who is the Secretary General of the African um, Socialist International. Um, and he will lead us through a presentation. And as we said, this is an international fight back. So you can expect to see us everywhere. And um, Comrade S.U. Louise will um, give us a presentation um, right now. So thank you, comrades. And uh, thank you, those who are sharing and donating in the chat. I see you. And I just want to acknowledge that. Um, uhuru. Uhuru, um, Comrade Louise, are you on the call? Or maybe you yeah, can. Sure, I'm on. I'm trying okay. to get the video, the start of video, but he's not letting me do that. Okay, we I'll see you now. You working now? Uhuru, right. welcome. Uhuru, Comrade. Uh, Chair Moise, thank you so much uh, for your leadership over uh, this uh, campaign. Hands of Uhuru, Hands of Africa. You're doing a remarkable job. So. So I want everyone to, uh, who is watching to emulate uh, your leadership. I also want to recognize Director Kelly uh, for this powerful overview that uh, everyone should watch several times. 
because uh, there is a, is a teaching uh, tool uh, to help everyone to understand uh, even this event uh, today. I would like to salute everyone uh, who is joining. And uh, I would like to salute Chairman Omani Shela, uh, the founder and the leader of the rural movement of the African Peace Socialist Party, also the leader of African Revolution. In fact, the leader of the World Revolution. I will say a few uh, words about that uh, in a minute. And I want to salute uh, Comrade Jalil uh, Muntagim and uh, everyone who uh, uh, will be uh, watching this program and uh, also uh, Comrade Tafai, who is also a panelist. I want to salute uh, uh, Dex and our work he's doing as well. And uh, I just want to say, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, this attack on the 29th of July, uh, as everyone knows, is a political attack. It's a blind attack, you know, uh, from the uh, White House. Uh, it's not uh, something that's happened just like that. It's a response uh, to the effectiveness of the leadership of Chairman uh, O'Malley. Uh, because just as it was in the 60s, uh, in time of uh, uh, Lumumba's leadership, as most of you, uh, you already are, are, f are familiar uh, with the uh, attack uh, on the Lumumba, because when Lumumba was on the scene, it was during the period revolution was on the rise. So it burst on the scene when the revolution was on the rise, and it was clear to the United States government, uh, to the colonizers, uh, uh, governments around the world, France, uh, Britain, uh, South Africa, uh, all of them. It was clear that the Lumumba uh, was, uh, a, will be an effective leader uh, in consolidating the revolutionary struggle of African people, not just uh, in the Congo, but throughout Africa and uh, throughout the African nation. So the colonizers saw that it was clear to them and uh, if you see today what's happening uh, to the world, uh, everyone start saying or talking about the decline uh, of the West, uh, something the chairman pointed uh, as early as 1981. If you read the first report to the, uh, to the Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, 1981, you will see chairman is talking about that. And uh, so where we are now, uh, there is no one, uh, but Chairman O'Malley uh, talking about African redemption, uh, leading the struggle about Africa, or African people redemption, leading the struggle about one Africa, one nation, uh, making it necessary that the nation can exist without building uh, an African economy. So we need as African nation to have our own economy, uh, leading the struggle for African flag, uh, the Marcus Garvey uh, flag. If you see the popularity is acquiring today, you will see there is no other political organization that puts that flag forward as the African People's Socialist Party. So there's something is clear uh, to uh, the US government. And uh, most importantly, uh, the question of a mode of production. This is a fundamental contribution. Even the, the uh, academic, the leading academic institutions like Oxford recognize that, invited the chairman of O'Malley to go to uh, Oxford uh, University in England. And uh, the model production being exposed as the foundation, as the cornerstone uh, of the existence of capitalism uh, basically freed not just African um, uh, oppressed uh, our nation, but also all the colonized nations and including anyone who wants to be a progressive force in the world has to recognize the significance of the model of production as separate, as different from capitalism, as something that gives a life to capitalism. So that's really significant. So to me, it's a qualitative leap. And this basically puts the chairman aside, marks him as you know uh, a leadership definitely over the whole process uh, to fight to overthrow uh, capitalism at its foundation. And that makes it clear you have those forces like the masses who are fighting against capitalism, but 
under chairman's leadership, we're fighting against colonial capitalism, which is not the same things because capitalism depends on colonialism. So that is just fundamental. And uh, it can't be reduced to anything else, but to recognize who's leading the struggle uh, to end uh, uh, capitalism in the world is the one who's leading the struggle to destroy its foundation, mode of production, which is colonialism. That's really critical. So we can say the 29th of July attack was also an attack for that significance, for that uh, contribution, because, because we are in a different place right now in the world where everyone is talking about massive polar and thing like that. Uh, and the world we want to build is a world without colonialism, which is different from just saying you want to a world uh, that is multipolar. And uh, the significance also of the African Peace Society Party is also based on the fact that the United States, as you know, is the leading, the leading colonial capitalist force in the world, is the hegemon in the world of colonial white power in the world. And uh, so the attack on the Mumba was led by the United States government, just as the attack on the African People's Social Party and the chairman and all the comrades, uh, the four core, uh, I forgot the words, but all the other comrades who uh, are, have been attacked by the, uh, by the US government, you know, it's the same process. The US attacked the Mumba government because the Mumba was leading uh, the anti-colonial uh, revolution in the Congo, and the, the U.S. attacked Chairman of Madison and African Peace Society Party inside the U.S. borders because they are the leading force against the U.S. government and also against colonial capitalists, not just in the U.S., in the world. So, you know, you're looking at the same thing, the same trajectory, uh, basically. And uh, the United States played a key role in assassination uh, of Lumumba, not only they facilitated the hunting of Lumumba, because they couldn't hunt down Lumumba without the coordination, the uh, CIA uh, throughout uh, the US embassy and other uh, CIA forces uh, donated to the new colonial forces like Joseph Mobutu and, uh, and other forces. Without the CIA intervention, the Belgian, the Belgian colonizers would not have been able, they couldn't be uh, they couldn't beat Lumumba basically uh, with uh, the participation, with the involvement, direct involvement of the United States uh, government. And when Lumumba was brutally, savagely, as you know, uh, killed, murdered, you know, tortured, uh, mutilated, within a period of uh, two years, we had basically a renewed uh, offensive in the Congo. The revolutionary movement was not defeated after the was assassinated. On the contrary, it was uh, the death of Lumumba mobilized a lot of people. So we had a new movement basically this time clearly targeting neo-colonial forces in the Congo at the time. And they were able to take control of over half of the Congo. Some forces talked of a three quarters of the Congo were under the leadership of anti-colonial forces. And uh, those forces were defeated because of direct US military intervention. And this really, really, really critical. Uh, not only the United States, as I said, helped overthrow and murder Patricia Lumumba, but they also helped to overthrow the, uh, the anti colonial movement that was, I would say, even given life by the assassination of Patricia Lumumba. And this is how the US did it. In 1964, on November 24, 1964, this just, just over a year after the uh, Organization for African Unity was created, the U.S. sent uh, something like a dozen of uh, C-130 uh, airplanes. They sent uh, paratroopers from 82 um Airborne uh, of uh, forces, they send the twenty, the three hundred twenty-two uh, division uh, from the U.S. forces base uh, in Europe. They supply uh, uh, planes with uh, pilots uh, from uh, Cubans who were expelled by the revolution in Cuba uh, in the Congo. So 
the bombs are the revolutionary forces. And you have to bear in mind, those revolutionary forces were not equipped, like in Vietnam, where you had a revolutionary leadership who organized and equipped uh, uh, the Vietnamese uh, to fight back in the Congo. We didn't have that. We still uh, were unarmed most of the time and fighting with uh, rudimentary, you know, basic uh, traditional weapons. And we were bombed by those planes. And not only the U.S. supplied those uh, uh, planes, the Belgian Troops also uh, were sent to Congo. I remember Congo just became independent or allegedly independent from the Belgian. And in complete violation of international law, the Belgian sent troops there too. So the, we talk about 100,000 uh, people killed in that process, just in the eastern part of Congo in particular. And uh, this couldn't happen without the U.S. involvement. And I think it would be good for people to, to make that link that the U.S. government, when it attacks us in the United States, it attacks all Black people because the U.S. is the headquarter of the uh, colonial powers that is determined basically to prevent Africans being free. The United States government is a, is a strategic enemy of African freedom. And uh, this is the uh, connection between the assassination of Malcolm X, Patricia Mumba, uh, uh, Dr. King, and their assault on uh, African People's Society Party and his and his leader, Chairman of Mali Sheila. That's the connection that recognize uh the leading force against uh, uh the US uh uh domination basically of the over the African nation and the forces leading that fight to end that relationship. And uh this time uh, we are informed that the struggle is to overturn colonialism as the model production. This is something we didn't have uh, in the 60s. Uh, this time we inform that we have our own philosophy that binds all African people everywhere around the world, which is something we did not have. Now we know the struggle for our consciousness to get rid of the false consciousness we have and acquire a true consciousness that we are all Africans everywhere we are. And uh, the struggle of black people everywhere is the struggle to consolidate the free and consolidate the African nation. So there is no separate struggle. There is no separate African nation. Uh, you know, according to our philosophy of African internationalism, is a one people, one struggle. And every attack on African Free Society Party, every attack on our leadership, Chairman of Malishela, and any leading member of the African Free Society Party is an attack on African nation. Is an, a, an attack to prevent us from completing our task of of, of redeeming Africa, and uh, that's really you know uh, is uh, some of the things that I want to uh, to talk about. And uh, also where we are right now, we are winning. And I think this is also something that motivates our enemy, uh, you know, to attack our leadership. We are winning. When I say we are winning, you heard Director Akile mention how African internationalism is coming back to us uh, through even uh, the media of the bourgeoisie, of the colonial bourgeoisie assault, but also through different forces uh, around the world, including the African people bourgeoisie. Everywhere you go, people talking about colonialism, you know, uh, it, there's something that was not really systematized we are the one who have made it system, you know systematic that you have to talk about colonialism 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 and now we're talking about model production and you can see if one start talking about model production and that's a recognition uh of uh the leadership uh of chairman of Maricela. and uh also that uh this is something uh i'm, I'm going to repeat uh chairman as i said uh many times that uh our struggle uh, is a struggle to unify the African nation. Our struggle is the struggle for the emergence of the African working class as the leading force in the struggle for the redemption, unification uh, for African nation. And uh, this is something that nobody really can take away uh, uh, from us. And that's why even the, to celebrate the African martyrs, we're breaking through what we call the colonial uh, borders celebration where the Cameroon, they'll celebrate, they'll remember the martyrs from Cameroon, the Congolese, they'll celebrate or commemorate the martyrs from Congo and South. But here, with the leadership of uh, African Peace Society Party for the first time, now we start to make, to make it the same. That everywhere we have to celebrate the African martyrs, which means remembering all the Africans everywhere who, whose life was stolen in the process of resisting 
colonial domination for our people everywhere. And this is a part of a victory uh, that we can celebrate. That's why today we are strong and we are optimists because we are winning everywhere. We're building in Europe, we're building in Africa, uh, not just in English speaking country, we are also winning in French speaking uh, 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 countries. So we are growing and uh, there is nothing the FBI, the US government can do uh, to stop uh, the African People's Socialist Party. It's too late because the vision of chairman is already out there in the world, is in the head and the brains of many Africans uh, everywhere. So we just say, stop the FBI attacks on African People's Socialist Party, hands off, uh, Uru, hands off Africa is too late. We are winning, oh comrade, and I thank you for the privilege uh, to be uh, on on, uh, on this panel. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, Secretary General Luwezi Kinshasa, who also serves as the international chair of the Hands Off Uhuru International Organizing Committee. I just really want to appreciate you and salute you for that um, for that overview. And as you said, the connection is clear. It is undeniable. We should not, you know, see it any other way. Um, the assassination of Patrice Lumumba to the attempted assassination of Chairman Amalia Shetela to political prisoners who we will, um, you know, one who we will hear from today. This attack continues. And like you said, one Africa, one nation, and we will overturn this colonial mode of production. So I just want to really appreciate you, Comrade, for that, um, for that um, presentation. And I want to appreciate everybody who has, um, who is still with us. We want to encourage you to continue to donate. But before we do, I want to thank and appreciate those who have have donated today, helping us reach our goal. Today, we have so far, we have raised a total of um, $1,085 towards our $2,000 goal. So we only have about 915 left to go. I want to thank Carla for your $300 donation, Dolores for your $75 donation, Halima for your $10 donation, Leah, $250, APSC, $100 donation, an anonymous donation for $100, Penny for your $50 donation, Kamau for your $100 donation. Um, Ember at $20. Thank you so much, Ember. Kimberly at a $20, uh, $50 donation, an anonymous, and another anonymous at $25. Um, and also uh, Gloria at $5. Thank you so much, Gloria. And also um, Becky Kamau. We're going to see that, that total coming in soon. So actually, our new total is $1,205, which means we have $795 left to go on today. And I know we can make and we can make that call. And I also want to, um, and that includes actually um, Becky, like I said, for 100 and Raya for your $20 donation. So salute to you comrades who, who answered that call early on in this program. And we are moving on to our next presentation. So continue to donate um, to fund this legal fight back. Thank you, comrade um, Secretary General Luwezi, Kinshasa. And um, I want to now invite up uh, Director Tafari Mugedi, who is the chair of the African People's Socialist Party in occupied Azania or South Africa. Um, uh, comrade um, uh, Chair Tafari also serves as the vice chair of the International Hands Off Uhuru Hands Off Africa Organizing Committee. Uh, so we just really want to salute these comrades who are doing indeed what we are called to do, which is to unite African people worldwide and are taking this on fiercely. So uh, Chair Tafari, I want to appreciate you for being on and you're going to give us a, a, a presentation about the work happening um, throughout the African Socialist International, but also the, um, you know, how this all connects back to to the July 29 raid. So thank you, comrade. Uhuru. Uhuru, uh, comrade uh, Chair Mwesley. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanna salute you, comrade, for all the work that you've been doing, uh, you know, uh, in the Hands of Africa, Hands of Uhuru campaign. And, uh, you know, of course, um, I want to salute the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement. Uh, you know, uh, Chairman Omali Ishitela uh, and uh, the, Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party. And I want to salute all the comrades, you know, of the Uhuru movement and uh, the supporters of the party and movement, everyone that's, uh, you know, making a contribution to this um, campaign, you know, the Hands of Uhuru, Hands of Africa campaign. I think um, uh, at this point, we have, you know, a sense of how serious this is and, uh, you know, uh, how significant this campaign is in terms of African people overall. Like it has already been stated that this attack on the Uhuru movement is not just 
an incident, but then it's an attack on the plight of African people, you know, to fight for self-determination. You know, we saw with them, what's this? Uh, you know, with, with the whole document that's attached to this, uh, you know, imminent uh, indictment, you know, like identifying leaders of our movement as uh, unindicted uh, co-conspirators and so forth, that uh, the claiming that African, uh, you know, like uh, the, the African, African people, you know, the, the members of the Uhuru movement, the Uhuru movement, the leaders of the African People's Socialist Party, uh, you know, were instructed by Russia. Uh, to raise the reparations demand, you know. Uh, so they, they acknowledge that, you know, there is an impact that's being made by the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru movement, the leadership of the African revolution in raising the consciousness, uh, you know, uh, of, um, of African people and actually taking, uh, you know, the, this, uh, this whole movement, the resistance to higher, uh, you know, to, to greater heights and so forth. So that's what the African People's Socialist Party has been able to do. Um, over the years. So as it has already been uh, stated, uh, comrades, uh, please bear with me. Uh, it's, it's a bit dark here, you know, there's no power and I have my uh, candle on right now. They, they are, they, there's this thing called load shading throughout the, the country in South Africa right now. There's, a, there's an energy crisis, you know, which is something that we're gonna be talking more about in terms of, uh, you know, how this is, uh, you know, a, an indication of colonialism, the fact that Africa has all these resources, but then cannot even generate enough power electricity, uh, you know, for, for its population, you know, it's because Africa does not have an African economy. What we have is a colonial economy uh, that has as its primary uh, purpose, you know, the, the extraction of raw material resources and labor, uh, you know, to go and and feed the white nation, you know, the colonizer nations and, and all the imperialists. So I am going to speak about the, um, the work of the party here on the African continent, especially here in, um, in, in South Africa. As it has already been stated, I am the director of organization for the party here in, uh, in Africa. And uh, so we have uh, the, 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 the party and movement um, in, um, in West Africa, in East Africa, as well as in Southern Africa. Actually, right now, what we are doing is we are concentrated on building these regions. You know, so the comrades who are in Southern Africa, for example, uh, we have the party here in, um, in South Africa where I'm based. We've been around, as you can see, I'm wearing an Inpidam t-shirt, uh, Bread Peace and Black Power, which is uh, a, a slogan from, you know, 1981 from the African People's Socialist Party. You know, we're still upholding the same thing to say that African people have demands and we're fighting for, uh, for self-determination. So we are here uh, in South Africa. We are building uh, two mass organizations, uh, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, which uh, already is building branches. Uh, today, actually, we went to Soweto, you know, to meet a comrade there, uh, Noponzo, uh, Poponzo, who's going to be building an Inpidam branch in, so in, in, in Soweto. You know, so the, the, the movement is growing here in, um, in South Africa. We also have um, UPDEP, the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, uh, which is, uh, you know, organizing young people and, you know, um, you know African people of all ages in, um, in, in, in the Everton West community there with Comrade Asa. So we are on the move here in, um, in, in Occupy Azania, but not only are we based in Occupy Azania, we have Comrades in Swaziland, uh, in Namibia, uh, we have Comrade Visto there and the Comrades um, are in Namibia on the ground building in Pidam. We have Comrades in, in, in Zambia, in Botswana. And, uh, you know, we're also making um, headways into, uh, in, into Malawi. You know, so throughout the Southern Africa region, you know, we are applying this um, regional strategy that was developed by Chairman Omale Chitela. You know, so um, from the... Uh, the seventh Congress, the political report to the seventh Congress, uh, you know, Chairman Omali Ishtela laid out this strategy for African people to consolidate, uh, you know, our efforts uh, from across the world, because as African people, we exist as a dispersed nation, you know, so we have to recognize, you know, our own uh, power uh, in, in, in being a unified force, because divided, the enemy understands that uh, when we have all these 
uh, colonial entities that we refer uh, or miscategorize as uh, nations and so and so forth, you know, like South Africa, Botswana, uh, you know, like Black America and so forth. We are African people. We are members of the African nation from wherever we are. So we are applying this regional strategy in Southern Africa, as well as in West Africa, where you have our comrade Che uh, Molai, who is in, um, in Sierra Leone. You know, in Sierra Leone, we also have the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. Actually, I just I also want to say about the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, UPDEP, uh, led by comrade um, Aisha Fields, uh, that they are working on a on a um, conference that's going to take place, I think, from the on the 17th of March. You know, um, uh, you know, advancing this uh, project that we have, uh, institution that we have, known as Project Black Ank. You know, which is an, an emergency response. Uh, you know, like entity that we have in the uh, in in the in the movement. You know, uh, African people right now. Like, if you look at Southern Africa, for example, there are tropical cyclones that are approaching. And uh, you know the lives of African people are always at risk. You're gonna hear about thousands of people losing their lives unnecessarily, you know. Uh, and and we don't have our own capacity to respond in this manner. So the All African People's Socialist Party, I mean the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, uh, which is uh, there in Sierra Leone and also there in South Africa, is gonna be uh, having these conferences. You know, so there is that coordination taking place. Uh, you know, moving as one organization across the the continent. Uh, we are also there in Liberia, in Ghana, uh, in Nigeria, and we are you know building in the francophone uh, you know front as well uh, with with Comrade Ignace and the Comrades there in uh, in Benin. Uh, so we are there throughout the, uh, the, the 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 continent. You know, so the African People's Socialist Party is building. You know, and we need um, to recognize that. We're not ju just doing this for the sake of doing it. We're doing this because uh, we have a plan, uh, we have a program, and we have the obje an objective of rallying all African people, two billion strong, you know, African people throughout the continent and the world, uh, you know, under the banner of African internationalism, uh, the red, black, and green of Marcus Garvey, you know, for a unified and liberated uh, and socialist um, Africa. That is the, you know, the the objective of the African Socialist International. And we are working towards that, you know, in, um, in, in very practical ways, in very practical ways. Actually, I just wanna, you know, announce that uh, in, in the month of April, we are going to be having a, a conferences in Southern Africa, the Southern Africa Regional Conference and the West Africa Regional Conference. And then we're going to have all sorts of forces there, you know, declaring that Africa must unite and that, uh, you know, down with imperialism and down with neocolonialism. So, Oro, I just want to uh, also speak uh, in terms of recognizing this week as being the week of the, um, being the, the week of the African Matters Day. You know, the 21st of February is the date in which uh, Malcolm X, an African matter, was assassinated by US imperialism because he was fighting for African liberation, fighting for African people to have our own capacity to be self-governing, to be self-determining, some, something that the Uhuru movement is centered around, you know, this, the same reason Malcolm X got attacked uh, and uh, eventually assassinated is the same reason that the Uhuru movement is being attacked today. And uh, so with, 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 the, with, with, with that, we want to recognize African matters here on the African continent, um, and uh, especially here in, um, in, in South Africa, where I am based, you know, we want to recognize uh, you, comrade uh, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. And um, I think um, this year is uh, the 45th uh, anniversary of, you know, the, 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 the assassination of, um, of, of comrade Petris, uh, I mean, uh, of comrade uh, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. So we're going to be commemorating that. We have to up, up, uh, uphold these African matters, as well as, um, you know, Steve Biko, who was, uh, you know, like uh, murdered, I think a year before uh, the, uh, the, the death of, of, of comrade um, uh, Robert Mangali Sosobukwe, you know, brutally murdered by the South African police. And we have to say he was murdered by the South African police because that's, uh, that's who it is. Uh, because when the ANC came to power here, they did not, uh, you know, get rid of the colonial state, which is 
the power, you know, the thing, the force uh, that makes us to act a certain way, you know, uh, the force that makes us to stay in the townships, the force that makes it impossible for us to go and get our land. You know, it is the state, the state that the ANC uh, government maintained, the state that was not uh, destroyed, uh, you know, just inherited. And then uh, with, with, uh, with the black administration, a black government in the form of these uh, neo-colonialists, you know. Uh, so uh, he, Steve Biko was brutally murdered. Uh, we want to recognize other leaders like uh, comrades like uh, uh, who was, uh, you know, like a prominent leader in the 1960s. Uh, and, and uh, I think in early 70s, he was actually killed through a, uh, a parcel bomb in, in Botswana by the South African state. You know, they killed uh, uh These are some of the, you know, like names that are not even known by, by young people here. Uh, in South Africa, you know, but we are supposed to know all the sellers, uh, you know, that um, that have have left African people at uh, at the mercy of imperialism, uh, which which has no mercy actually, you know. So um, this is where we are, comrades. There are many more African matters that we can recognize because in the African People's Socialist Party, uh, we also recognize the fact that you know anyone that dies under this social system, African people, you are an African matter. You know, because you're struggling every day to make ends meet. You're struggling, battling with this social system just to, uh, you know, put a meal on the table. Uh, you know, you, you have to fight with the police. You have to fight with the, uh, you know, colonizers who want to hoard and, and, and keep and exploit uh, our resources. We're battling with these, uh, you know, forces on a daily basis in South Africa. We have no electricity, but uh, we produce electricity in South Africa. The African workers in the townships, are the ones who are responsible for producing electricity. But then we don't have access to the electricity throughout the, um, uh, the, the country, you know? So this is colonialism, comrades. It is colonialism. And uh, we have to build this, uh, you know, like this, this campaign, the Hands of Uhuru campaign, and we have to build the movement uh, for the total liberation of, um, of, uh, of Africa and, um, and, and, and African people. So I just want to say that comrades, uh, here on the African continent, throughout the continent, we're building committees, and you can be part of these committees. You can become a volunteer in the committees. Uh, actually, this is just speaking to the fact that it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can uh, be part of this campaign, the Hands of Uhuru, Hands of Africa campaign. We have the Culture Committee. If you're a musician, you can join the Culture Committee. If you're an artist, a fine artist, you know, you make paintings, murals, and all sorts of things. You can make a contribution in your community, uh, in your local area. We can contact the uh, broadcasting agencies, the, the, the television uh, programs or the radio programs, and have let them know about this campaign. Uh, you can also join the agitation and propaganda, you know, committee. Uh, you know, produce flyers, produce our banners, and all sorts of things. Uh, you know, for for the campaign. Uh, you can join the finance and fundraising committee. Uh, you know, th there's there's a role to play. There is always a role to play for you, comrades, regardless of where you are uh, in the world. So join this campaign today. Um, ask about what to do. Go to handsofuhuru.org. You can go to the Hands of uh, Uhuru Facebook page. Uh, reach out to the, um, uh, to the campaign organizers, and they'll let you know uh, in terms of how to be part of this campaign. Um, campaign. So I want to salute um, you, comrades, salute the leadership of this campaign, uh, uh, Chair uh, Mwezi, and all the comrades here. Uhuru. 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 Uh, comrade Chair Tafari, just really want to salute you for, again, not enough time to go over the history of um, a resistance of African people and our African martyrs. And as you said, we are African martyrs in terms of, you know, how how we are living right now, we are not meant to live this way. And so we, you know, we can't call this life, but while we are alive, we have to make the sacrifice for, like you said, total liberation. And I just want to appreciate you, Carmen. I know it's late there. And as you said, you know, the energy crisis, right? And there's no reason to quote you that Africans, you know, should have all, the Africa should have all these resources, but not able to generate enough, you know, electricity or, you know, for our own population. So um, we need an African um, economy. And this is the anti-colonial um, activity that came under attack by the African People's Socialist Party through what we call dual and contending power, building our own 
um, anti-colonial economy that negates the power. So I want to appreciate you, Carmad, for laying out all the ways that the people can get involved in the Uhura movement as we are deep, deep on the ground and we will continue to build fronts wherever we are. So thank you, uh, Chair Tafari, and just want to salute you also for your relentless um, work, comrade. Um, and the call for African Martyrs Day. You can check that out on our website. You can, if you want to do an African Martyrs Day event, please let us know and go to handsoffuhuru.org slash events and you will see um, um, you know, an opportunity to um, select and to submit your own African and Martyrs Day event or, or teach-ins. So again, go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Um, make a donation today. Help us reach our goal of $2,000. I'm going to move um, right on to our next um, uh, presentation. I really want to salute this brother. This is um, Brother Jalil Muntakim, who is um, on with us, and um, hopefully we can um, get him for the time because I, there we go, Uhuru comrades. So I just want to take a moment to introduce you and just appreciate you for uh, being on today, regardless, um, you know, of circumstances. So um, Jalil Muntakim was released from prison uh, to parole on October 6, uh, 2020, after being confined, confined for almost five decades. Uh, Jalil is a veteran member of the Black Panther uh, Party and the Black Liberation Army. The co-founder, along with deceased comrade sister Safia um, Bukhari uh, of, 2020, of 2003 and Baba Herman Ferguson of 2014 of the National Jericho Movement to free all political prisoners. Founding Jericho in 1998 was just one of Jalil's many significant achievements. During this time and during his time in prison, comrade Jalil received certification in office management, architectural drafting, and college degrees, bachelors of arts in sociology, and bachelors of science in psychology. He mentored other prisoners and resolved numerous prison beefs. He stood by his principles and maintained the highest level of discipline, integrity, and self-respect and respect for others. Jalil's activism never ceased and is unquestionable. He has consistently provided movement leadership and guidance under the worst of conditions behind concrete and steel bars. Jalil is the author of We Are Our Own Liberators, also Escaping the Prism, Fade to Black, and his essays have been published in several books, magazines, and newspapers. Karma Jalil continues uh, human rights activism and movement building in the fight for the release of the remaining national liberation and civil rights era political prisoners. And you can find more about that at uh, thejericomovement.com. And while in prison, Comrade Jalil um, called for the establishment of the In the Spirit of Mandela Coalition, uh, the major historical initiative that on October 5th, 2021, the International Tribunal um, jurist found the U.S. corporate government guilty for the charges of genocide against Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. And as we say, the struggle continues. And we want to appreciate you, Comrade Jalil, for joining us today. The floor is yours, Comrade Uhuru. Uhuru, uh, Assalamualaikum, peace, pause, the Baragani, Gambo, uh, and whatever your language is, I speak to you in peace and solidarity. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, I want to thank uh, 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 Chairman uh, 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 Yasajela for giving me an opportunity to speak to his audience and to his, his party in this group, uh, so his supporters are here nationally and uh, internationally. It's important for us to be able to develop the kind of cooperative working relations that we have with the various organizations that we have in the country, this country, we call Turtle Island, the original name of Turtle Island, uh, in this country, where we are arguing and fighting for our own liberation and independence. Um, as an activist and revolutionary, I do identify myself as a revolutionary, I identify myself as a new African revolutionary and a Muslim, right? Our goal is just to have to be one to liberate ourselves from the, the colonial yoke, the colonial yoke of white supremacy and capitalist imperialism. There is no other way for us to survive uh, they have been moving, they have been operating in terms of the kind of genocide, not the kind of genocide from the Holocaust, but a genocide, a slow, uh, a perpetuing, uh, uh, di diminishing, uh, dehumanizing, demeaning, uh, denying the prosperity of black people, uh, African people, new African people in this country. And so our goal objective is to divorce ourselves from that. We will divorce ourselves from that on the basis of the recent decision by the international jurors on October 25th, in 2021, where they determined that the United States was found guilty, I repeat, found guilty of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people on five charges. The five charges are one, mass incarceration, two, uh, the killing of black people, 
uh, by police taking station uh, 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 murder as they attempted to kill uh, a combat yesterday. Uh, 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 inequitable uh, uh, health, uh, inequitable health uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> policies and procedures, whereby we, black people in this country, are uh, often uh, 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 our life expectancy and our mortality rate is less than that of white people, right? Uh, white people live twice as long as black people. Why is that? Why is it that white people live twice as long as black people? Why is it that greater mortality, infant mortality rate for black people than it is for, for any other people on, on, on this planet, particularly here in Turtle Island, right? Uh, another uh, inequitable, uh, inequitable uh, uh, decision was made by the international jurors was that of um, uh, environmental racism. Why is it that our community has so much asthma? Why is our community has so much heart ailment? Why is our community has so much kidney ailment? Why is our community uh, suffers from the degrees of uh, uh, uh mental illness and various forms of, of, of uh, uh, physical uh, ailments as a result of environmental uh, racism? Right? Third one is political prison. This is the political prison in the United States. The fourth one, political prison in the United States. Right? We know the political prison exists in the United States, but the United States refuse to recognize that there is, in fact, resistance against white supremacy and capital supremacy in this country. Right? So we raise the, raise the, the, the names, raise the, the, the value of our comrades who are incarcerated, right? Why are we all raising them? Because they represent the resistance in our struggle for liberation and independence in this country. They have to be recognized. We have to understand of the sacrifices they made. It's imperative that we do so in order to strengthen our struggle and strengthen our understanding that we are engaged in war. Make that point explicitly clear, right? We have been engaged in war. They have, they have engaged in war against us. And so, therefore, we have defended ourselves against the kind of racist horrors that we have suffered in the last 400, 400 years in this country, right? Uh, and, and lastly, of, of course, is the question of, um, of uh, health, equities, environmental racism, political prisoners, and, 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 and uh, uh, the killing of, of our people. Those are the five. And if you look at the, the five cumulatively, we can see how we have been actually, in fact, uh, suffering the killing conditions of genocide in this country. Right now, what is important by this, this decision by the international jury? Seventy something years ago, the great Paul Robertson, the great W. B. Du Bois, the great William Patterson made an attempt to bring the charges of genocide against the United States. This is on December seventeenth, nineteen fifty one, about two months after I was born. Seventy some years later, we succeeded what they attempted to do to, to, to achieve. We actually got a verdict. We have called the international jurors to the United States, nine international jurors, esteemed body of international representatives of various organizations, including the Human Rights, Human Rights, uh, 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 United Nations Human Rights uh, 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 Council, was here at Malcolm X uh, Memorial Center, Malcolm X Benjamin Badge Memorial Center, where he held this tribunal, international tribunal, and they found the United States guilty on those five charges of genocide. So what that informs us, we have to remove ourselves from harm. We have divorced ourselves from a system that's been engaged in the process of genocide against us for the last 400 years. It's not a question. It's not a question about that. Right? And nor do we have uh, uh, any way to, to, to validate right? our existence here in the United States, our existence here in Turtle Island, without understanding the history of resistance that we have had uh, in the last 400 years. Uh, our comrade, uh, uh, M. Weezy, I don't know if I said her name right, M. D. Way is that way, right? Explain, mm -hmm. the, yeah, thank you, sis. Explain the, the history of resistance, much of the history of resistance in this country, and we continue to do so. In 1966, right, what happened? We had the Black Panther Party. Black Panther Party for what? Self defense. Why do we have to build a party to defend ourselves? Right? Come an easy question that we need to answer. Why? Because we've been under attack. That's why. For 400 years. And so for us, moving forward, we are moving to what we call a people center. We're going to build what we call the people's Senate. Right? We are divorcing ourselves from the system of oppression. Divorcing ourselves from a system of repression. Divorcing ourselves from a system of white supremacy. Right? And this means we have to also build what we call decolonization programs. We have to decolonize our minds. Right? We have been traumatized to the extent that our trauma has been normalized. That the way that we live today, the way we're conditioned we live today, it's been normal. Like this is the way we're supposed to live. Hell no. We are not. Right? We are better than that. We are better than what they think we are. The second great. I even say that. 
as a people. You look at the resilience of us as a people in this country and around the world, how we have resolved ourselves to be to survive, right? Not to survive, but to prosper. And that's our goal and objective. And so for moving forward, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're doing, right? We build a word called People Senate, and we're doing something else. Other. We build a word called Folded End, Front for the Liberation of New African Nation. But those who identify themselves as New Africans, right, who identify the fact that we need to divorce ourselves from the system of oppression, the system of white supremacy, the system of capitalist imperialism, then we need to begin to build the kind of institutions Alternative institution, alternative survival programs, what I call decolonization programs. The Black Panther Party calls these survival programs. And for me, that I, the idea of survival program is the defensive posture. Right? So we're going to take the offense. And the offense is this year. We're going to build what we call decolonization programs. We're going to decolonize our thinking. That's what we can decolonize the world in which we live in. Right? And we're doing the process of doing so. And so that's what we're going to do. Decolonization programs across the country, and as a process of doing so, we're going to unite these decolonization programs. Brother, a national, international bro brother, we're going to call Fuller then, Front for Liberation of the African Nation, right? We talked about the struggles in Africa. Uh, we're talking about the, the previous struggles in the 60s and 70s in Africa. We talk about uh, 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 um, MPLA. We talk about uh, uh, Folinon, uh, 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 Flimo. We talk about uh, um, um, uh, the struggle in Namibia. Uh, in, in uh, South Africa and Zania, uh, in other parts of the world, where is our struggle? Where's ours, right? And so what we find, we have a collection of, of, of resistors, resistors across this country. We have to figure out ways how to unite ourselves. We have to figure out our power is in our uniting. One thing we got to understand about capitalism, capitalism is based on two principles, individualism and competition. What's the opposite of individual competition? Unity and cooperation. We have to unify our movement and we have to build cooperation amongst ourselves in terms of our goals and objectives to achieve going forward, right? The idea of Pan-Africanism has to begin with the idea of our building our own nation. How can we contribute to Pan-Africanism if we ain't got a nation? We have established ourselves as a nation. We have to, that's a must. And so for us, since 1968, when the Black, when, uh, uh, as an example, the uh, Republic of New Africa provisional government came into existence, declaring that the five states, the Black Belt South, belongs to Black people, it is our inherited, our inherited homeland in this country, right, in Turtle Island. We've been negotiating with the, with the indigenous communities about these particular areas. I, I'm giving you another example. My great-grandma is Muskegee Indian, Muskegee Creek from Alabama. We have this kind of relationship with the, with the indigenous community and indigenous population here. And we need to build upon that. Thank you, sister. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we need to build upon that. Okay? And that's our goal and objectives. So we're going to build what we call the People's Senate, right? And we're going to build what we call Fuller Than Front for Liberation of the African Nation, right? And we're calling on all our comrades, all our brothers and sisters, come to sit down at the table. Let us work this thing out, right? That's, first of all, let's be sure that we have our own identity. Who are we? Yeah, we said we are Africans, and no doubt about that. But here in this country, we have evolved into a new African people, right? Evolved into an African people based upon who? Based upon the messenger nation that we have suffered as a result of our uh, being captured and colonized in this country, right? That means we can speak to we speak to the Portuguese, right? We can speak to the Spanish, we speak to the English. This is part of our language. It's part of who we are, right? This is who we have been messaging with. Right? With the Arawak, with the Tianos, with the Seminoles, with the Cherokee, with the Creek. All of us, we are in this fight together. We have to understand that they hate us. The only way they win in this country for our labor. Now I'm going to put step back and just look at one more issue that we're talking about here. The United States was found guilty of genocide on the basis of one of the charges was genocide. Genocide against uh, on the basis of a mass incarceration. All right, we know that we've been suffering some mass incarceration. We know that our community has been targeted for mass incarceration. But one thing we don't only fully understand is the law and how it apply, and that means the Thirteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution. The Thirteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution says slavery and voluntary servitude shall not exist except for those who have been duly convicted of a crime. So what is going on with mass incarceration? They are ushering our people back into a penal system of slavery. Slavery still exists in the United States. 
And we've been blind to, we've been ignorant to, we have not read the small, the small print in the 13th Amendment. Now we're making that small print bold, right? Penal slavery, it exists. We're going to end it. And when we end penal slavery, we're going to end mass incarceration. Can we, we take away the incentive of corralling and ushering our people to school the prison pipeline? What do you think that's about? To maintain the system of slavery. All right, so slavery system continues in this country. We have to end it. End slavery. End mass, end mass incarceration by end penal slavery. So across this country, we have a movie going on called 13 Forward. If no one knows about it, uh, check it out. 13 Forward. Wherever you are in this country, fight the end of uh, penal slavery. Right? Fight to change the Constitution of whatever state that you're in. Remove the language of penal slavery out of their Constitution. Remove it out of their Constitution. This is part of our movement. All right? It's extremely important and part of our movement. Why? Because we change the dynamics, the dynamics of our relationship with this country in terms of crime and punishment. How our, how our communities have been targeted. They're targeted for a purpose. Let me give you one more. Let me just share one more thing. I have one more idea in regards to 1865 when they promulgated the uh, 13th Amendment of the United States. The 13th Amendment says that individuals cannot hold people as property and as slaves. But that caveat in there says, that exception clause in there says, the state can. So they removed, they removed black people, African people from the hands of white folks who was using us as slaves and put us in the hands of the state. That's what it came back with, like the black codes, right? As a means to usher us back into this penal slave system. They came with Jim Crow as a means to usher us back in this penal uh, uh, slave system. They came back with mass incarceration, mass to move us back into this system of, of penal uh, of slavery. So that's a goal. Right, because when we raise that question, then we raise the entire history of our resistance against penal slavery. We raise our entire history against the ideas of our community being targeted, targeted for our babies and generations to be ushered back into a system of penal slavery. So that's one of the goals of objective. How are we going to change this idea of we being uh, we not being charged with genocides, for mass incarceration? We will take the, the money out of it. That's how we challenge capitalism. That's how we challenge white supremacy. That's how we challenge we being targeted, our community being uh, targeted. Wherever you are in this country, I'm asking you. In fact, I am begging you, right? Organize a campaign to end penal slavery in your state. Five, seven states have done so already. We're moving right now from New York State. I'm building a campaign in New York State to end penal slavery, to take the language out of the, out of the, and therefore our, our comrades in the inside, those on the inside, our people on the inside will be considered incarcerated workers. Why? Because the word slave, the word prisoner is synonymous to slave, according to the law. Now, what Jalil says, what the law says, the law says that prisoners are slaves of the state. So we have to change the language in order to change the narrative, in order to change our condition, right? As you think and determine the fact of how you behave, right? Or how you make your decisions. And so we are now going to start identifying our people as the process of abolishment, abolishing. We're going to identify them as incarcerated workers. They're workers. They've been brought into the system to work for pennies on a dollar while the government makes millions off our labor. Slavery. That's what it is. And so what we're going to do, we're going to change that dynamic. We're going to start identifying our people inside as incarcerated workers, making part of the working class and making part of the working class struggle. We're going to ensure that they receive minimum wage for their labor. We're going to ensure that they uh, obtain uh, the same laws and, and guarantees of labor laws, right? Health codes, benefits, and everything that goes on outside should go on, on the inside. We're going to ruin this idea of penal slavery in this country, and we're going to start in the process of abolishing the system of incarceration the system of penalizing us for being black in America, living black, uh, driving black, uh, 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 being black, breathing black in America. All right? That's our task. That's our goal. And so for us, it's extremely important for those who believe and identify themselves as new Africans, right, to begin to codify the idea that we need to build a national front, front for liberation of a new African nation, right, where the majority of black people still live today, Right in the black belt, that's where we live, right? And many of our exodusing, exodusing back to the black belt, migrating back to the black belt, right? Because we cannot find a way that we can survive ourselves and have the community that we need to have 
in urban areas or in 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 uh, the West and in some other parts of the country where we migrated as a result of that hundred years of lynching that we suffered as a result of the Black Codes and Jim Crow and the whole idea of uh, after the Emancipation of Proclamation, all right? And so for us, we're knowing that history and knowing our, our degrees of, of resistance that we have and our continued degrees of resistance that we have, it is extremely important that we become more organized, more unified, more directional, intentional, purposeful in terms of our goals and objectives. And for me, the goals and objectives is national liberation and independence. There is no other goal and objective. There cannot be. We have to divorce ourselves from a system of, of genocide, period. And so I, I want to share that with you all uh, in terms of our, our, our development, our goals and objectives. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, I was in uh, Greece about, about, about four months, five months ago right, for the anti, uh, uh, international anti-imperialist movement for, in support of political prisoners. And at that time and at that position in, uh, uh, in that space, I told them, and since he told the world, ain't nobody gonna be free in this world until black people are free, period. Why is that? The black people have been held down all around the world. I don't care if you go to Australia, Germany, uh, 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 Turkestan, or, or, or Timbuktu, right? Uh, 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 and Zania, uh, go to uh, Britain. Black people's all held down, right? Black people's at the bottom. So how in the hell the world gonna be free and the black people are not free? How's that gonna happen? When black people are free around the world, the world will be free. Okay, and that's the system, that's the, the principles of Pan-Africanism. Why well, we need to connect ourselves as, as the great uh, Marcus Garvey did, right? The greatest international organizer that we've ever had in our contemporary time, where he had organized black people, organized African people in Africa, during the Caribbean, and down south, in, in the Turtle Island, as well as in Europe. We have to re resurrect that, uh, that goal, we have to resurrect that idea, we have to resurrect that, that love for our people around the world. That's Pan-Africanism. Okay, and so for me, for me, and for us, and our struggle that we engage in here, uh, here in Turtle Island, uh, building the People's Senate is extremely important, right? And building Fallen On is extremely important. That's where we're going to move forward, right? We are asking our comrade uh, of, of uh, African People's Socialist Party to join us in this determination, right? We have to unify. We got to find principles of unity so we can move forward uh, uh, with the uh, uh, National Black uh, uh, Liberation uh, uh, Movement and the various other forces that we have in this country. Again, I want to thank you. Uh, uh, and I want to tell our, our comrade, Yasatilla, man, we got your back, bro. We got your back, right? We all in the struggle together. We got your back, homeboy. All right? We, he, and I have been, he and I have been going back and forth since 1978 when he came to Oakland. I was organizing the Union Petition Campaign to the United Nations, right? And organized for the first uh, a revolutionary newspaper called Army Spirit, uh, a prisoner's newspaper back in 1967, 68. Let me assume it's 78, 78, 77, 78. When I was in San Quentin prison, right? And just got, just got, just got paroled. And so we got a long history of struggle, a long history of, uh, of, of developing our, our relationship with one another. And we need to uh, strengthen that going forward. Hands off your rule. Hands, Hands off, off the Africa. Man. Yes. And all chairman, Yashitela. Uh -huh. All power to the people. All power to the people. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Jalil. I just really, I mean, I'll, I will applaud <laughs> because I'm the only one in this room, but I just want to really salute you, comrade, and just, you know, appreciate the fact that we have you on this side. And as you said, we are engaged in a war, um, you know, wherever we are, whatever land we are on. And as you said, we are on stolen land by the indigenous people, which came from this attack that happened on African people. And we are, wherever we are, we have to fight back. And I really just want to salute, you know, the work that you had put forth in terms of, as you said, your construct, your struggle and this struggle of all the peoples continues. And I uh, just want to really appreciate just the simple science of what you said, you know, like, you know, individualism and competition versus unity and cooperation. Like, you know, now is the time to get organized. And as we understand the highest form of unity is organization. And so we, you know, this, this is a really important time. And I just want to read a comment um, or two, because there was just a lot of unity in the chat. I hope you get a chance to go back and look at that, Brother Jalil. But this, this one is from Comrade um, 
shoot, I, I can't go back because I can't, I, I didn't write down the name, but it says, Uhuru Kamar Jalil, your struggle to be liberated from um, active incarceration is indicative of the power of African resistance against colonialism. We need to acknowledge that um, that no matter where we find ourselves as Africans, we are all imprisoned through capitalism and its proxies until we overturn the system of oppression, colonialism. Will Africa never know freedom? Easeway late to e Africa. And that was from Comrade Visto, if I'm correct. And um, comrades Betty and Ralph um, say free all political prisoners. So thank you, uh, Betty Davis and, um, and Ralph Pointer. And I just want to, again, salute you. And I hope you can stay on with us for the Q&A, uh, Brother Jalil. Um, so Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. I will try to stay on. Right now I'm in the hospital doing some crisis, the family crisis. Uh, but uh, I will try to stay on as long as I possibly can. Right on. As long as we have you, we want to just appreciate you, comrade. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody. Yes. And I want to thank everybody who is still um, on this call, you know, fighting back in the chat, fighting back with your donations. Um, I want to, before we move on to our next speaker, Chairman Amalia Shatella, I want to just take a moment to salute um, our donations that continue to come in. Um, I want to thank Lisa for your $20 donation. I want to thank Jackson for your $20 donation. Kitty for your $4 or $40 donation. I also want to thank uh, Cam for your $50 donation and OPA for your $30 donation and a, a, a statement of a donation from uh, James McLean is for $500. Salute to you, uh, James, and thank you, everybody. Just really want to appreciate um, that, um, that, that remarkable statement on today. As we said, not today. To this group of people right now watching this webinar are going to make sure that not only do we raise our goals, but that we send a message to the United States, to every every colonizer in every form of the state that we are not that we are not retreating, we are building and that the people are fighting back. So I want to just really salute um, our recent donors. And that takes us to a total of um, one hundred and thirty five dollars left to raise. So I I. I I know we will make our goal, but but we have to be about it. So I'm going to just say, go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Make your donation today. Show um, show that, again, the U.S. government and these attacks on the African People's Socialist Party, that they made a mistake by even laying a hand um, um, on any member of our movement. So thank you, comrades, so much. And um, it is now my honor to uh, introduce... Um, our next speaker, and I want to just thank so much our presentations thus far. I'm going to um, take a moment to introduce Chairman Amalia Shetela, uh, who is the founder and leader of the Uhura movement and the African People's Socialist Party. Um, and the, uh, um, as we have said, a Florida organizer for SNCC since um, in the 1960s. Uh, he has taught the world that capitalism is parasitic, um, built on slavery and colonialism. He has built a mass movement for reparations, holding the World Tribunal on Reparations to African people in 1982, and led the world in making reparations a, a household word. He has taken the movement beyond protest, creating over 50 institutions as the infrastructure for our liberated, our liberated African economy. And he is the author of many books, including his most recent book and report to the Seventh Congress, African People's Socialist Party, Vanguard, the, attach, um, the Advanced Detachment of the African Revolution. And he provides the leadership, as we know, for the world's anti-colonial revolutionary struggle. He is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Socialist Party and the African Socialist International. I want to um, welcome you, Chairman Omalia Shatella, and just say Uhuru. Uhuru, comrade. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru. First of all, I really want to express my appreciation to you, uh, Comrade Chairwoman Mwezi, uh, for not only presiding over this really important webinar that we're doing today, uh, but the leadership that you provided for the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa uh, 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 committee that we've been uh, dealing with since this attack that was made on us on July 29th. Also, I think I, I want to acknowledge the presence. Of, there are some of us who are at the Uhuru House here where I am located in St. Louis. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the presence of, of Comrade Brother Cam Howard, uh, who is a leading force in the struggle for reparations and has been stalwart uh, soldier um, on that march for quite some time now. Uh, somebody I've, I've had the pleasure of working with for many, many years. Uh, 
Also seated next to Comrade Cam is uh, Comrade Shafia, who is with the Universal African People's Organization. And uh, one, of, one of the things that makes it important for me to identify uh, these two people, one of the things is that both of them, uh, that is to say, uh, uh, Cam Howard uh, and also Shafia and Universal African People's Organization, are members of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations, an organization of organizations. There are now 18 different organizations who are part of the same formation. And if you notice, the last name of our organization is Reparations. So that's, that's really high on our agenda, has been for a very long time. And it contributes to something that Comrade uh, uh, Jaleel just mentioned. And I wanna salute Jaleel as well. It contributes to uh, consolidating uh, a certain, not only a kind of uh, abstract consciousness, but uh, political program, unity within the liberation movement of African people in this country. And that's, that's extraordinarily important for us as it has already been recognized. So I think that uh, Jaleel uh, sort of understated <laughs> There's, we have had this relationship for a very long time. Let's just say a long time ago, we had a, a, a deeper relationship. And, uh, and he, uh, as it was said, a member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. I also knew, uh, I worked with uh, Comrade uh, uh, Bukhari out of uh, who at one time when I first met her was Bernice Jones. And she was working out of the Harlem, New York uh, branch of the Black Panther Party and uh, became a member of the Black Liberation Army. I was there uh, in Virginia uh, when she was captured and uh, attempted to organize a defense committee uh, to, to free her when that occurred, Shafia uh, Bukhari. And, uh, uh, and Jaleel, uh, the thing I loved about the, the Black Liberation Army, one of the things I loved about the Black Liberation Army is that they did not believe in staying in jail. <laughs> <laughs> they, they definitely, they, they had a strong aversion <laughs> to remaining in prison. 13th Amendment or not, <laughs> those brothers and sisters were intended, they intended to get out of those prisons. I really loved that. It was such a powerful uh, statement of uh, the determination of African people to be free. And I think that it's important for us uh, also to recognize something else. And I did not intend to go into what the, the prob a problem for our movement that many people have not yet understood, but is the basis for this discussion we're having today, this webinar uh, that responds uh, to our fallen warriors, uh, to the African martyrs. Uh, one of the things that happened was the, 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 the intensity, the extent of the war uh, that was initiated against our movement. Because they didn't just lock up political some political prisoners, damn near everybody went to prison. I mean, the whole movement was almost in prison, which is one of the reasons that you saw the sparks, these prison rebellions that were happening at the time. They killed 40 some odd people in Attica. I don't, I don't remember how many people they killed in Florida and what have you. Uh, revolutionaries were shuffled into these prisons. Everybody was in prison. And that meant there was nobody to get the people in prison out of prison. And this was a fundamental contradiction that we were confronted with. In fact, some people made careers, I'm talking about so-called white leftists, made careers off representing black political prisoners. They became the spokesperson for our movement because so many of us were locked up in prison. We had a, a fierce battles with these uh, forces who became spokespersons for the black revolution because so many of our forces were locked up in prison. So I want to just uh, say how much I respect the, st the struggle. Uh, and uh, as Comrade Jaleel uh, inferred, I think that, you know, uh, there was unity and struggle. Uh, and, and we have had struggles and we do have differences on some questions and that's all right. Um, uh, one of the problems that we suffered as a revolutionary movement is some of the ideological struggles that we were engaged in in the 1960s. Uh, when many of our warriors fell, uh, it was the apex of, uh, of uh, revolutionary theory, African intellectual theory uh, in the world at that time. All kinds of ideas were being uh, dealt with. And in fact, they were so, 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 so uh, significant 
is that the U.S. had suffered a, a, a political and ideological defeat in this country. Black people had turned their backs. Many Africans turned their backs on the U.S. government and we're looking for alternatives. That's why there was a Black Panther Party. That's why there was Jomo. That's why the uh, Republic of New Africa. Do you understand? Republic of New Africa, not just Black people, but a republic, our own, et cetera. This was the way things were being articulated, the direction that Black people were going in. But there were many uh, uh, issues that did not get resolved. I mean, I was a part of the Black Power movement. I participated in the first direct action of Black Power while a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, but what is black power? What did it mean? I mean? One thing was really important, it meant power. That was a distinction that we saw in the black power movement that was leading to the struggle for liberation as opposed to trying to integrate into a system. We need our own power. And that's what we are talking about today. That's one of the things that's so important and everything that Comrade Jalil has said speaks to that. We have some differences about what that means. We have some differences even about who that means. What is the African nation? We, definitely, there is an African nation. We think it's a huge African nation, uh, more than almost two billion strong, stretched across the globe, a forcibly, forcibly dispersed at gunpoint. And that when we talk about Africans in this country, uh, we are talking about, uh, we, it belies the whole notion of America being some kind of uh, a, a nation of immigrants. Africans are not immigrants, we're captives. Right. That we came here at gunpoint. We're the only population in this country that did not come here looking for a better way of life, but we lost a better way of life as a consequence of coming here. And I think it's really important when we talk about that, to understand that what happened to Africa as a consequence of our being here didn't just happen to us uh, who uh, in New Jersey, it happened to black people around the world. I mean, Haiti, the most magnificent revolution that's happened in history uh, was done by African people in Haiti who have been captured, who've been taken to Haiti at gunpoint. Uh, and then when they took, when Africans had the first successful workers' revolution in the world, had the first successful slave rebellion in the world happened right there in Haiti and it inspired black people everywhere, including inside this country. That was an inspiration for Denmark Gressi and others. Uh, and because the Africans in Haiti said, uh, if you get to Haiti, if you're a slave, if you get to Haiti from any place in the world that you will be free, we will give you land and everything else. Didn't say you had to be from Haiti, but not only that, the white people called it Hispaniola. Africans took the land. They didn't call it, what they, how did they characterize? It? They characterized it by the name that had been given to it by the indigenous people there, Aiti, and extended the reach of the African revolution everywhere. So that was the most significant, it was the most significant attack on capitalism in the world. Because the whole economy of the world at that moment revolved around what? Slavery. And the Africans in Haiti rose up and, and dealt this significant blow on that and then attacked slavery, uh, slavery everywhere. The first uh, president of independent Mexico, Guerrero, African. And then what did he do? He uh, tried to see if they could uh, fund expeditions from eight Africans in Haiti to do what? After he freed slavery in Mexico, he tried to get uh, Africans in Haiti uh, to mobilize and, and form a military excursion that would go to Cuba. The free Africans there, because we won Africa. One nation forcibly dispersed from throughout the world. And Africa is starving today in part because I'm here in St. Louis yeah. on the land of the indigenous people that France had to give up. It was owned, controlled by France, but they had to give it up. Napoleon couldn't hold it. Why? Because of the revolution in Haiti that defeated Napoleon's greatest army, that defeated the, the French, defeated the British, uh, defeated the Spanish, and what have they made that revolution? Haiti did that. Yeah. It's one Africa, one nation of people. That's the point that I would make. And to the extent that we understand that, like, like uh, Dessaline understood that in Haiti. He didn't say, oh, uh, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> he said, Coupete, Bouli yeah. cut off heads and burn houses. That was the slogan that happened in Haiti. It was a definitive statement about what had to be happening if African people were going to be free. The colonialism had to be destroyed. And not only that, because there was somebody else that everybody loves Toussaint Louverture. He was a brilliant man. 
Uh, but he was satisfied with the new colonial solution. He was. He was ready to concede uh, certain powers to France, even after they had won, beat France. And France, being a colonial, arrogant colonial power, said to him, uh, yeah, okay, we can talk about it. Come, come meet with us on the ship out here. And Dessaline said, man, you crazy if you get on that boat with them white people. <laughs> and, uh, and this brilliant uh, general in Tucson got on the boat with them, and you know what they did, don't you? Anytime they get you on a boat, you know what they do. They, they sailed away. And you know what they did with them? They took them to France. Not only did they take him to France, they put him in a prison on a mountaintop where he, they froze him to death. But Dessalines, he remembered. A lot of people don't like Dessalines because he said, Coupe boule kai. He said, pay in kind. They kill one, we kill one. They kill two, we kill five. And so this was, uh, this was a revolutionary movement. I just want to say that that's the power of the African revolution. It's been global. It's been global. And Africa suffers today in part because I'm here. And we suffer today <laughs> because we are here. You know, so uh, many people came here looking for a better way of life. We lost a better way of life as black people, as Africans, because we were brought here. And yes, the best friends we had after getting here was not white liberals and the white man. It was the indigenous people that nobody don't even talk about them. They live in concentration camps that people euphemistically refer to as Indian reservations, their land. They're on so-called reservations. You can't even see them anymore. When, 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 when uh, Napoleon had to give up this thing that they call the Louisiana territory that includes Missouri, where I'm standing right now. Of course, Jefferson wanted to do this because he's a great white liberal that everybody loves. Right. Uh, he had to do that. He was a rapist. Right. He was a pedophilic rapist, raped seven, 13 year old Sally Hemings and made babies by her. And we don't know how many other people he did that with. Right. Uh, uh, used to the, the Americans used to uh, say it wasn't true. But when they, they couldn't get around it, they said he was having an affair. How the hell does a slave master have an affair with a slave? It's not like she can say not tonight, honey, I got a headache. <laughs> You understand? This is this is this is not the way it works. Never has worked. He was a he was a beast, and this is the basis of the democracy that people experience in this country and in Europe. All of Europe uh, came about as a consequence of taking freedom from black people and from other people who are colonized around the world. The vast majority of the people on Earth live under colonial domination. And I think it's really important for us to stand understand this. I want to say this because I don't have much time, and I've spent too much time already uh, uh, in this vein. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, uh, Portugal, when we met Portugal, when we met Europe, what, there was no Europe when we first met the white man. There was no Europe. There was no white man. There was conceptually, because you don't mean no white people. How the hell are you going to say a white person? They ain't white. White is a political and ideological concept that they constructed to define them in distinction from the rest of the peoples of the world because they were living off the flesh and the blood and the resources and the hopes and aspirations of, of and dignity of the peoples of the world. And it started with what they did with Africa, where that's where the colonial, colonialism began with Portugal in the 1400s. When I say colonialism began, I'm talking about in terms of what we, this modern iteration of, of colonialism that we recognize. So, so when you had Portugal, Prince Henry, the navigator, you learned about him when you were in school, the great navigator, this intellectual itch that the Europeans had, right? That they were gonna go out and see the world, was it round, who was where, et cetera? No, 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 no. Europe was starving and it was unfree. There was no freedom and they lived under feudal domination. Feudalism uh, was a, a, a draconian of, uh, existence, no rights. Only the king had rights. Only the nobility had rights. In fact, uh, they had this concept they call it, what? The divine right of the kings. That was the feudal order uh, that existed at that time. And uh, so there was no freedom. Uh, and there was poor. Europe was starving. And I'm not saying this to cast aspersion on Europe. I'm just talking about history so that we can know what it is that we're dealing with, what our problem is, how to fix the problem. 
as opposed to continuously just complaining about there's a science to revolution. It's, it's a science and an art. That's what we're talking about. So you see uh, that uh, Europe was really literally so poor that uh, 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 like in England in the, in the 1300s, uh, it is true that people actually were eating their cats, their dogs, bird fecal matter because I guess for the seeds and stuff and their babies. That was in England. That's a little bit of truth. I'm not making this up. I've learned a long time ago, you don't have to make up no, no white people. <laughs> That's redundant. <laughs> you know, so this, this is the truth. And so what, what was it that sent uh, Prince uh, Henry out? What was it that uh, rescued Europe from this point of starvation and ignorance? It was 1328, something extraordinary happened that they heard about. And there was this black man who traveled from Mali uh, all the way going to Mecca with 60,000, a, a, a group of 60,000 people on camels and horseback and walking. Took him three months or so to get there. His name was Mansa Musa. And all along the way, he was building mosques and passing out gold. They'd never seen any riches like that before in their lives. That was a black man that came out of Mali that did that. So now you have a starving Europe. You have an economically, this almost, almost wasted Europe. And this, this thing about this black man, this man that came from Africa with all that gold is something that, they, that, that was a part of what they understood. And so Henry is looking for that gold. They're going to Africa, not out of some curiosity about whether the world is round or not, whether the gold is there. And so they start off around the coast of Africa. This is where modern agriculture began. What we now characterize as modern, the whole political economy of the world as we ignore it today begins, begins to be constructed at that point. You talk about reparation, talking about a parasitic relationship that was imposed by Europe on the rest of us. Henry, the navigator. I don't know if he was ever on a boat in his life. <laughs> if, he, if he taught Columbus, and this, you want to believe this myth that Columbus thought he was in India, uh, it, he, did, he wasn't that helpful, was he? So uh, sugar. You see Portugal take these islands off Africa and begin to enslave African people. And this is where you have the mass production, plantation production of sugar. Changed the world. It was part of the process. Because now, Dave, it, it introduced sugar into the diets of Europe. What usually was just this, this, this luxury thing that only a handful of people had. Now it means that people had more energy. They could work harder and do all this kind of stuff. All this stuff begins Portugal and then all over Africa. You see this movement of Europeans who used to, who became Europeans in the process. Before that, they were Celts. Before that, they were, where they were Nords and, 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 and other characterizations defining European tribes who define themselves in relationship to each other. What is it that changed that? It was the slave trade as they characterized it. It was the attack on Africa. It was looking for these resources in the colonial process, the process of developing colonialism around the world. And so now the, these people who live there define themselves not in relationship to each other, but in relationship to us. This is a thing that consolidated a sense of sameness, organized around a particular political economy that people recognized as the essence of nations and nationality. Anyway, this is the beginning of a world economy where before there was no world economy. People may have traded with each other in various places, but there was no world economy, no economy that linked the whole world up into a single entity. This world, this economy that destroyed feudalism in Europe, the feudalism where most of the white people were Europeans, but people who they call Europeans were trapped to the land, had no rights at all. Only people that had rights <laughs> was the nobility. And of course, the church, divine right of kings. That's why one of the reasons the struggle against uh, uh, feudalism, one of the most important ideological affronts that I heard, I really appreciate, was of a Frenchman named Diderot, who made the declaration as a part of the struggle against feudalism, said man should never be free until the last king had been struggled, strangled with the intestines of the last priest. <laughs> so uh, I like that. <laughs> and uh, so this was the feudal order, and it was destroyed. 
And you see coming out of this process, a whole new, a whole new economic force emerges. Uh, and these are the forces they refer to as capitalism. And Marx called this a capitalist mode of production. We said Marx was wrong. What we had is a colonial mode of production. It was colonialism that hooked the entire world together. Even when Marx talked about the origin of capitalism, what does he say? He said there was a primitive accumulation of capital that started it all. He said this primitive accumulation was first what? Turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. He didn't say turning Mississippi. He said turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. And then he connected that to what was happening in the East Indies, talking about the Indian people. The British killed something like, like uh, 50 million or more uh, people in India as a part of the process of colonialism. So you have a whole world economy organizing around colonial domination of peoples, including the indigenous people here and the various other places around the world. That's what the war, that's what the war in Afghanistan is all about. That's what the attack on Venezuela is all about. That's what the assault on peoples around the world and in North St. Louis. It's about colonialism. And what is colonialism? It is the the foreign and alien occupation of a people and domination of a people. Foreign and alien, but you can't recognize they're foreigners because they live on the same territory you live on. But just like you, they're foreigners. They're not indigenous to this land. The indigenous people, you don't even see them. Because they're so beaten down. And we have to be careful even as we build our movement. We have to be careful in terms of how we define and understand ourselves and other people around the world. Because we are not only part of the African Revolution, we are part of the revolution of the Americas, of the Americas. Black people are, African people are. And that doesn't mean that we ain't Africans. It just means that the, 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 that the African Revolution came with us. It didn't like they, we came to this country and got free. No, Africa was assaulted. I am in St. Louis today because Africa came under attack. I think it's really important for us to understand that reparations are due to Africans in Africa and here as well. People have got some kind of calculus that they want to make that kind of distinction artificially. And don't make a mistake about it. I, I recognize the significance of, of the, the, the fact that African people in this country are organized. The first World Tribunal on Reparations uh, in 1982, happened in Brooklyn, New York, an international panel of judges. And we found the United States guilty of genocide, uh, found them guilty of owing black people reparations. We used the same basic doc information that Comrade Jaleel was just talking about, that they just did something around. In fact, we're reissuing the book that we published called Reparations Now is being reissued in a greater form because we're putting more of the testimony that was left out of the first one in this one, that's, that's coming out, I think, in March. You see, so this is, an old, this is an old story and we need to be connected with each other so that we can understand this. And the, the point that I wanna make that's really important because I only have a couple of seconds is that Jaleel is here and Sunni Ada, my man, you know, fell, Asada, failed. How many other people failed just in the recent period? That's what I'm talking about now. Uh, but they fell as a part of the attack on the Black Revolution, defeat of our military defeat in our revolution. The same force process that killed Malcolm. Look at the time frame that we're looking at. Look at the time frame when they killed Lumumba, when they overthrew Nkrumah. Look at what happened. The Black Revolution of the 1960s came on the international assault. You got to have an international strategy to deal with, and you got to link up African people all around the world as ability in the, in the process of fighting against it all. So what do you have? You say, we talking about voting. You know, we got a school coming up in April because we teach African people who, how to, to struggle against the monopoly uh, that the black petty bourgeoisie, these sellouts, that some people call them the, the, the what do they call them? The miss, the some kind of, what do they call them? Misleadership class. It's a class. They're the petty bourgeoisie. They're people who, who have, uh, have sacrificed the interests of the masses of the working people uh, for their own interests. The vast majority of black people are workers, working class, if you can get a job. And uh, uh, so 
know, you have uh, this situation where we have a school coming up. We teach people how to run for office. And but they run for office, not just on anything, because the Democratic Party does that, too. But we teach people how to run on a, on a reparations platform. Put reparations on the agenda. Put reparations in your platform. Put free all the political prisoners on your platform. Put, put uh, black community control of the police on your platform. That has to be on your platform. Take that space. Black people fought and died for that democratic space, and we should never concede it to anybody so we don't allow the African petty bourgeoisie to monopolize that, monopolize that space, and we don't sacrifice it easily. And part of what the attack on us on July 29th was, is this incessant way that they try to deny us space, the democratic space that we fought for, we died for, people bled for, they deny you that space so that you end up making premature actions that won't win masses of African people to make this struggle. They attacked the Black Panther Party, they attacked the African People's Socialist Party, they killed a uh, co-founder of the African People's Socialist Party. But the fact is, the Black Panther Party bore the brunt of this, uh, this assault inside this country. But you look at the period, 1965, they killed Malcolm X. What else happened in 1965? They passed the Voting Rights Act. 1965, the Voting Rights So you can vote. Then they killed Malcolm. 1968, they killed King, who was struggling for a poor people's campaign. 1969, they killed Fred Hampton, Black Panther Party there. 1969, they arrest. 21 members of the Black Panther Party in New York, New York 21, 1969, the FBI declared that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of this country. This was the war that was being waged against us. This is the thing that put, uh, uh, put uh, Jaleel and other people like that in prison. This is the thing that helped me in and out of prison on a regular basis, because this was a struggle on that sector, that part of the movement. It was a struggle to destroy the ability of Black people to fight against colonial domination, foreign domination, et cetera. So we say the martyrs, we recognize people like to go out and hold up their little Malcolm X uh, ceremonies once a year, and then, Mark, and then Marcus Garvey ceremony once a year. Martin Luther King celebrated the white man, give you a, a, a day to get drunk on and a name a street for him. They kill him and then give you a street. That ain't even yours because you can't even have a celebration because you celebrate too long. The police, I don't know a city where you don't have Martin Luther King celebration. People out there with their parades and stuff, the police don't tell you to get out of there before sundown. Right. So you ain't got nothing but a holiday. King organized. He tried to build a poor people's campaign. Raise up poor people. He died in the struggle for sanitation. Black workers in Memphis. Memphis, Tennessee, you know, and uh, that I got arrested <laughs> uh, when, with King's brother. When King's brother was brought to town in St. Petersburg, Florida, sanitation struggle. This is 1967. Uh, so, you, you know, you had these struggles going on, but whatever they were, however they were articulated, they were struggles against colonialism. We might not have known what it was, but that's what it was. And because it was foreign and alien domination, it's the white man, for lack of a better word, who came uh, to represent this foreign hostile power that had intruded itself in our lives. I was at a, a meeting just a few minutes ago with Brother Cam Howard. He's on a tour now uh, where he's uh, doing this campaign to win African people everywhere to unite uh, uh, with uh, putting forth this legislation of, uh, of building the, getting the consequences uh, of this uh, uh, HR 41 trying to force Biden. I'm talking about the same Joe Biden who said Black Lives Matter after he put, after he put uh, 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 the omnibus crime bill uh, in place and Bill Clinton in place who put 100,000 policemen in place who made the Black Lives Matter slogan come into existence because they were killing so many black people around. Biden, those are Biden's cops. Right. This is Biden's FBI that attacked my house on July, on July 29th. It's not some mysterious force that came from nowhere. That's Biden's organization. It's the Democratic Party that did that. Right. And we shouldn't let them forget we know who you are. And we also know our significance to the Democratic Party. Do you think that you're going to be able to shut us up because you want us, you don't really want us to vote unless we 
vote for what you want. Let's be put on the camp of what you want. Biden came out of the gate, said he did not believe in supporting reparations. He said that. So we put reparation on the ballot and then we get attacked. Right. You understand? And so uh, uh, this is the Democratic Party. And this is the Democratic Party that those people who claim to be your leaders uh, uh, have to serve our relationship to. We have to demand more than that. That's right. If you're going to get support of black people, you cannot have the support of black people on the one hand and then on the other hand, send the police and the FBI at our homes because we're trying to uplift the conditions of black people in this country. Won't work like that. That has to be our statement. And that's important. And one reason, and this is it, that is important, is because people saw what was happening. We didn't quite understand it. It was happening to me too. It was happening to other people. The Panther Party caught the brunt of this assault that, made, that was made against us. As I say, Malcolm was assassinated and King was assassinated and the Black Panther Party was the most widely uh, 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 distributed uh, force that was working right there among that, the working class, they call them lumping. But there was the Panther Party in housing projects and various other places like that who represented this powerful force. They would do things preachers wouldn't do who were supposed to be our leaders. The intellectuals, they, we created revolutionary working class intellectuals. They, it, was, it was these young people who taught the police who they were, made it necessary to provide political education for the police because the police couldn't deal with these people out there on the streets who understood who they were better than they did. And so uh, we came under uh, this incredible hostile assault and we suffered a military defeat. Uh, of our forces, but it was a struggle against colonialism that they uh, attacked. And that's why Julia went to prison. And that's why uh, during the same time frame that I just mentioned, uh, the, F the CIA facilitated the, the murder of something like three million, three, three million people in Indonesia who were trying to be free. 1970, uh, they killed uh, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, 1963, uh, they, uh, they overthrow uh, Kwame and Krum. Uh, 1967, uh, when uh, they, after they had wounded and captured Che Guevara, they murdered him. So all around the world, this attack was being made on colonialism. But after the success of that attack, it wasn't being made on colonialism anymore because people were not talking about racism and not colonialism. And the struggle against racism make the white man like you. And, or some other thing like that. There's no source of power that you're fighting or racism. How do you know when you won? You know, does somebody come out and wave a white flag and say, okay, we surrender? You know, no, 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 no. But in the struggle of colonialism, it's about what? Power. That's when you know that you won. And uh, so that's, I wanted to say that. And just to say, uh, related to this whole issue of genocide, because the FBI said that the Russians told us that. I'm glad to hear Jaleel talk about how Paul Robeson and uh, Winston, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Patterson, Patterson, yeah, all these forces, you know, years ago, 1951, uh, they put uh, W.E.B. Du Bois on trial, on the rest of him and put him on trial for the same thing that they're charging me and the Uhura movement uh, with. This ain't no new thing, this is an old thing, but it's been obscured because people have forgotten what the struggle is about. We were talking about this today in the meeting where Cam was, was, was at, uh, because uh, he was saying that we have to learn how to resist and make the Democratic Party put it in a situation where it defend itself. It has to look at the reparations issue differently than it does, it has to act on it differently. Uh, but for that to happen, as he was saying, that Africans need to know that we got the power. Uh, and we, in order to have the power, you really got to know you got it because otherwise you're just there floundering around. Uh, but the other thing is knowing that you got it, you have to be willing to use it. And being willing to use it means to know that what it is you're fighting for, at least in broad and general terms. And if you think you're fighting to get the system to like you better, you understand, then you have one approach to it. And you will always try to find a solution within the Democratic Party. 1972, I think it was, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, what was the, the national the conference uh, that African people conducted? Something like 9,000 people went to Gary, Indiana 
and uh, they even threatened to build our own, own labor union, our own black political party. And as soon as that thing, but before that thing was over good, the Democratic Party had pulled all them black Democrats in, back in the line. You're damned if you're gonna do that. Because they knew the power of the black vote once it's organized to serve its own interests. And all of them work to make sure it doesn't serve its own interest, that it serves the interests of their oppressor. Anyway, uh, I want to say those things and thank everybody. I want to say that in this room uh, here, uh, representing from the Green Party, Yohuru Comrade Angelica, uh, <laughs> Uh, in this in this room, uh, two uh, uh, of the other uh, so-called non-indicted co-conspirators, uh, Jesse Neville uh, and Penny Hess. Uh, and this was an important development. Believe me when I tell you that, because when they killed Malcolm X, you didn't see no white people rising up, did you? You didn't hear no no. There was no white people in the streets that killed Malcolm. There, there was no recognition that this was something that affected white people in that way. In fact, some of them might have been happy. Even when they killed King, as black people made it necessary for them to put tanks around the White House because they thought we were going to burn it down. You didn't see white people rising up, doing anything like that. To kill Fred Hampton, you didn't see that kind of stuff happening. They could attack the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles a week after they attacked, it, attacked uh, the Black Panther Party in Chicago. Uh, and and uh, you didn't see uh, white people upset uh, doing anything about that. Uh, but now what you see, uh, we've developed a strategy and moving in such a fashion that they cannot attack us in the same way. They can attack us, they can attack us, but they're not gonna be able to narrow it down that we're just fighting Panthers. You're gonna be fighting your own democracy when you come at us. You said that we have the democratic rights to do this stuff. You said I have the right to you use the, the, the process of election. You said that I have the process, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. That's what it is that we are pursuing. So when you attack us, then what you're doing is exposing the fact that you don't really believe in any of that. You believe in freedom of speech, freedom of assembly for white people who say the right things and do the right things. Even for white people who stand up on the right side, then when you come to get us, you gotta to come to get them too. That's a remarkable difference in what they saw in the 1960s. And I just want to say those things. And uh, also that there was an 800% increase in the number of black people who were put in prisons uh, since the 19th, starting in the 1960s, moving through the early parts of the 70s. 800%, what, start, what caused that? It was the resistance, black people rising up because freedom is illegal for black people. It has to be illegal for black people. If you got a whole economy and everything rests upon the foundation of black people being enslaved, then how the hell are you gonna let black people be free? Can you imagine it being legal for a slave uh, to be free? I mean, you got a slave economy, a slavery mode of economy. How is it gonna be legal for a slave to be free? And so uh, even if they use terms like legality, uh, the fact is, in fact, de facto uh, slavery, de facto with the 13th Amendment that says you free except when we put you in jail. Uh, and in, in, in talking about the prison population, prison is genocidal, not just because it locks up a lot of people who will die there, because they lock, it's an attack, it's a form of birth control. Putting all these young black men in prison is a form of birth control. And so, you know, the Genocide Convention prohibits doing things that will, that will restrict the birth of the, of the people who have been subjected to, uh, uh, to this. If you look at uh, the situation in Chicago, uh, we have, uh, 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 I've just heard that something came out today uh, saying that uh, there is something like, a, uh, what is it, 400% increase in the number of black babies with syphilis in Chicago, a 400% increase. I saw something that said just a week ago, uh, that uh, in 2022, uh, there, were, there were only 15 days that the police was not, did not kill somebody. And I'm sure that's inaccurate because they didn't count the number of times the police ran somebody off the streets or uh, did some other kinds of things that killed people. Only 15 days. This is what we're living with. This is why this, this webinar uh, is so uh, extremely important for us. The question of 
of, of, of martyrs, the, the question of these political prisoners, how it all ties together in terms of the feet of black people just to be free, and this attack on the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement on July 29th. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uhuru. <laughs> Uhuru, Chairman. Hands off, Uhuru. Hands off, Africa. Uhuru, comrades. Um, Uhuru, Chairman, I just really want to uh, so I wish you could see the chat uh, during your presentation. And I know we have to move, but before we do, I just want to just briefly just really salute that presentation and just um, pulling it all together, Chairman, and um, just also appreciate the comrades on the ground who you, um, you know, who you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but again, like you said, Chairman, building, this is, you know, about us building the anti-colonial front wherever we are. And I just really want to appreciate, you know, you sharing, build, this is the revolution of the Americas. I just think that that's really important, like you said, about how we look at the struggle, because the struggle is taking place everywhere. And it's African people, and it's all colonized people struggling. And, and, um, um, like you said, the resistance, that 800% is a direct result of, of the resistance. And we're going to continue to fight back. And because like you said, freedom is illegal, but we are fighting for total liberation and abolishment and replacement, transformation, revolution of this entire colonial system. So um, power to the people and, and the people will be victorious uh, through the leadership um, of the African working class. So I just really want to um, salute that presentation, Chairman. And um, we are going to uh, move now to our, you know, as we move through our program, we're going to try to make up for some time here because we are moving into our appeal. And this is a time when we get to, um, you know, really, this is a part of the program when everybody, all attendees have a chance and an opportunity to participate. So um, I want to just take this moment right now to invite up, there he is, um, my comrade, our comrade, Jesse Neville, uh, Chair Jesse Neville of the um of the Uhura Solidarity Movement, and as the chairman mentioned, one of the quote unquote unindicted four co conspirators who will be leading today's very important appeal and urgent appeal with me today. So, Uhuru, comrade. Uhuru, Chair Mwesi. Uhuru, it's an honor to be here. Right on. All right. And uh, like we said, comrade, our commitment today is to raise a minimum of, you know, we started off saying our commitment was to raise a minimum of $2,000 towards the hands of Uhuru, um, you know, legal defense fund. And, you know, because we want to bring these total funds raised over and above the 160,000. If we raise that 2,000, we will definitely surpass that. And you can do that by going to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate um, right now. But uh, I don't know about you, Jesse, but um, comrade, I think we could even increase our goal because we are Absolutely. seeing donations coming in. And I mean, what do you think? <laughs> what about Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I unite. Right on, right on. So first, why don't we just, all right, well, let's do it. So we have a goal and we're going to make that goal and we're going to let you know how we can collectively make that goal today. But first, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible supporters um, who have already contributed to this urgent fund and drive up to this point. Uhuru, Chair Mwesi, um, again, I just want to say what an honor it is to be a part of this event tonight and salute to you, salute to Chairman Omali Shatella, the African People's Socialist Party, Secretary General Luwezi Kinshasa, uh, APSP Occupied Azania Chair uh, Tafari Mugheri, and Jaleel Muntakim, and just want to say uh, that I am I'm honored to be here as a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, organizing for white reparations to African people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, and also as the uh, part of the fundraising effort of the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa defense campaign that you lead, uh, Chair Mwesi. And I am very excited to be a part of this particular appeal for resources tonight because people have been donating the entire event. And our goal tonight was to break this. You see this thermometer right here? It says 158,982. That's where we were. We wanted to get at least past $160,000 raised towards the overall goal of $277,500. And we are now just $75 away from meeting that goal. And I'm going to put in $50. So that means we're $25 away from meeting that goal. Our goal was to raise $2,000 tonight. We are just about at that goal. So we want to take it to the next level and go to $3,000. And let's see if we can go. That's just the beginning. Let's double that. Let's keep it going. Handsoffahuru.org slash donate. And I want to 
go ahead and thank all of the people who have already gone to handsoffofruit.org slash donate and made incredible contributions, starting with our Freedom in Our Lifetime donors. This is the newly uh, named donor level of this campaign, people who contribute $10,000 or more. And this includes a profound anonymous donor who put in $70,000 towards this fundraising effort. And that is just an incredible stand uh, in, in waging and funding this fight back for the victory of the African revolution and all of humanity. We really wanna salute that anonymous uh, donor as well as Janice and Ruby, who are also along with the anonymous donor, incredible freedom in our lifetime donors. So these are people who have stepped forward and said that there will be freedom for African people in Chairman Omalia Chatel's lifetime and that the US government will not succeed in carrying out this vicious attempt to destroy the African revolution. So we salute these comrades and we wanna be like the freedom in our lifetime donors. And you can be like them if you wanna give $10,000 or more by going to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Next slide, Uhuru. We also want to salute our $5,000 plus donors. We're working on giving this one a, a cool name too. So uh, stay tuned for that. But this includes Marcus and Redbeard. And we wanna salute both of these incredible supporters. Uhuru, Uhuru, salute to Marcus, salute to Redbeard for these profound contributions towards funding the Hands Off Uhuru Legal Defense. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what this actually goes towards in just a second. So I just really, really wanna salute these. I'm very inspired by the stand that our anonymous contributor, Janice, Ruby, Marcus, and Redbeard have taken because it shows us that there are hundreds and thousands of other people out there like them who will be mobilized, who will be inspired to take this stand as well. And I'll turn it over to you, uh, Chair Mwesi. Uhuru, comrade. And I just want to say, before we move any further, again, handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. And I just want to, again, salute the incredible, um, you know, uh, you know, donations that you just, you know, laid out. And we want to go to our next slide so we can salute all of our 1K plus donors. Um, you know, you can see them here on the screen, but I want to just give a shout out to Leah H, uh, sorry, to Leah F, to Allison, to Charles and um, Inez Barron. <clears throat> Pete, to Penny. We want to thank Jabez. We want to thank Lisa and Dan and another anonymous donor. We want to also appreciate Nick, Reynold, Deputy Chair and Chairman, uh, Chair and Chairman Owners, and Deputy Chair Owners, and Yeshatella, and Chairman Omali Yeshatella, as well as Maureen. And again, salute to, um, to Kitty. And we also want to give a shout out to um, Sister Betty Davis for your $500 donation as well. So we want to just really appreciate um, all our donor levels. And again, handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. And again, we're going to continue to push this forward so we can even make that goal tonight. So Uhuru, I'm going to turn it back to you, uh, Jess. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. And we're going to give a special shout out to everyone who has actually donated tonight um, in just a moment. But I just want to say we are actually at $2,115 raised. So let's keep moving towards $3,000. Hands off Uhuru.org slash donate. And, um, you know, normally they say hold your applause, but don't bother. Just keep applauding throughout because we want to salute all of these amazing people who have actually become sustainers. You can go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate and sign up to contribute monthly and look at all of the amazing people who have already stepped forward to do that. So let's give a round of applause for, first of all, Pete Yarashuk is our highest level sustainer. Shout out to Pete Uhuru, be like Pete. All right, we wanna salute Wendy S, um, Jim B, Colin S, Emmanuel, Nathan, Peter, that's Pete, who I just named. Myself, I'm a sustainer. I'm proud to be a sustainer. Elise, Mensa, Brendan, another Wendy, Wendy C, uh, oh. Kat, Leah, Matsumella, MQ, Aaron, Bree, Halima, Johan, Fatia Ayana, John S, Kim, Mwazi, Grady, Rodney, Zoya, and Anonymous. These are all monthly sustainers who contribute every single month at various amounts from $5 a month to almost $200 a month towards this campaign. So shout out to these incredible donors. 
And finally, before we go into the goal for tonight's event, we want to salute everybody who has contributed since the last event. And I want to give a special shout out to, uh, to uh, ANWO president and African People's Socialist Party leader, Yejide Oranmila, who represented the Hands Off Uhuru campaign and the party at the anti-war rally, uh, Rage Against the War Machine, that was held in Washington, D.C. Uh, just last weekend that raised resources towards this campaign, as well as Faux Feet and Grace here in St. Louis, who organized with Project Black Onk, an amazing poetry event that raised over $350 towards the Hands Off Uhuru campaign. Ooh. And Uhuru, yes. Wow. Round of applause for that. Uhuru. Yes. And, and I also want to salute the National Day of Phone Banking and all of our volunteers who participated in the National Day of Phone Banking, uh, who got on the phones and are one of the main reasons why we are able to thank so many people who contributed since the last event. So I'm going to go through this really quick so you can applaud from wherever you are, but I'm going to go through this fast because we want to uh, keep this agenda moving forward. But we have the anonymous donors. We have Lisa, Carl, who put in $500. Shout out to Carl. Or who, who, Carl. Who, Carl. The, the APSP Midwest region, as I mentioned, that put in $356 from the poetry event. Uhuru. We want to thank uh, Joe Lombardo and the United National Anti-War Committee, UNAC, that donated $300 towards the Hands Off Uhuru campaign. Salute, Uhuru. shout out to UNAC and Joe. Uh, we want to thank Johan, $200. Marco, $200. The APSP Northern Region, $110. And then at $100 each, Anne, Kara, Dexter, Kamau. Oh, okay. This is going into tonight's event, I think. Or maybe not. Okay. We have repeat donors. So it seems like it's tonight. It's people who have donated many times. Uh, Kamau, Penny, Rage, Susan, Tanya, Wendy, Zoe, Mayasa, David, Eric, Imani, Jay, Joel, Matum, Aronde, Paul, Brendan, Christine, Sergey, Lauren, uh, MQ, Fatia, Ayana, Jackson, John, Pharaoh, Zoya, Janet, Kyle, Leandra, Nasha, Paula, Scott, Aisha, Ahmad, Albert, Gasso, Mwazi, and Bree. So huge round of applause to all of these people who have contributed. And that's, that's leading up to tonight. So this campaign is on fire and just want to salute everybody who has contributed again by going to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Uhuru Chair Mwazi. Uhuru, comrade. Yes, I just want to echo and just salute everybody who has helped us get to this point. And we are going to um, continue in, in just a moment to thank those who donated and made the stand tonight. But um, on our next slide, you're going to look at some of the givebacks. We want everybody to know that anyone who gives over $1,000 will be receiving a hands off Uhuru t shirt, which you can see here on the screen. Um, they, they are in many, well, many colors, black or, or, or red. But um, we have long sleeve t shirts and uh, regular sleeve t shirts. And for a 5,000, um, any donations above 5,000, we want to gift you with the Hands Off Uhuru sweatshirt. Um, as we said earlier on, we will be um, sending, we want to send thank you cards and a sticker to everyone who has donated, regardless of what amount. So uh, make sure that when you donate, that you fill out this form that we're going to put in the chat for you to make sure that um, you can give us your mailing address and the information that we need to send you your thank you card and your, um, and your Hands Off Uhuru sticker, no matter at what level. We appreciate you and if you haven't already done um you know um if you have already donated please put um please fill out that form already so we can get that to you right away so again i just want to appreciate everybody and you know um these 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 shirts look good you know so i mean you know get on the right side and you know you know get hands off of who and, and we're going to get some you know be an unindicted co-conspirator whatever that looks like but right now give us your information so we can thank you and we can send you your thank you gifts uhuru Uhuru. Right. Uhuru. Oh, Uhuru. go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just going to say, let's, let's go ahead and start thanking those who have already right. donated and contributed right on. Okay. All right. So, um, so we have $785 left to raise to reach our new goal of $3,000 tonight. If everybody who's still tuning in right now, put in about $17 each, we would surpass this new goal. But before we even get to that, I want to once again, thank everybody who has contributed uh, towards our goal today. And that includes Carla, who put in $300 and salute Uhuru once again to Carla. That is powerful. Dolores, who put in $75. 
Halima at 10, Leah at $250. This is one of our repeat donors. The African People's Solidarity Committee contributed $100 tonight, Uhuru to APSC. We had an anonymous contribution of $100, $50 from Penny Hess, Uhuru, $100 from Kamau, 20 from Ember, 50 from Kimberly, 25 from Anonymous, five from Gloria. Uh, Raya Fogarty became a $20 a month sustainer. Shout out to comrade Raya, $100 from Becky, 20 from Lisa, 20 from Jackson, 40 from Kitty, the $500 contribution from James McLinus, salute, revolutionary salute to comrade James, $50 from Cam Howard, and okay, it keeps going, $30 from Opa, $20 from Len, 20 from MQ, 20 from Parrish, 20 from Matum, 20 from Imani, and Angelica, who is in the room with us, contributed $100 of Huru to Angelica. Huru. And also in the room with us, Rage contributed $50 of Huru to Rage. Chimaranga put in $20, Pharaoh $10, and Johan $20. So that means, uh, Chair Mwazi, that we are at $2,215. We have cracked the $160,000 mark. So let's keep it going on that thermometer. Let's get another $1,000 closer to our ultimate goal of $277,500 hands off uhuru.org slash donate uhuru well you know what um if i heard you say we're at we have about 85 dollars to make it to the next 100 so i'm going to go ahead and put down 85 to just bump right. us up to the next uh to the next level and um sure. so we might have to do some reconfiguration of that 17 dollars amount but that's all good. Um, go to handsoffuhuru.org right now and make your donation. And, and that's my pledge that I will that I will honor um, when I you know get done with this. So Uhuru comrades. Um, but I just want to just take a moment to really, you know, um talk about the significance of why we are here today, why we are raising this, because and why it's important that we make that we made this collective commitment, right, to raise these resources for today. Um, you know, everybody made a decision to attend this event today. And, um, you know, I really want to just, you know, appreciate everybody that we can make this commitment together in this event and at least get closer to our overall goal with the ability for the African People's Socialist Party to fight back against the colonial state and put Put the FBI on trial. Who wants to see the African People's Socialist Party put the FBI on trial? So once again, you can do this by going to handsoffuhuru.org um, and take or, or, you know, make a pledge today if you're unable to make that today. But as we've said, a legal team has been assembled you know, for, uh, you know, the chairman and for other um, Amahura movement leaders who are being targeted by the FBI. But these funds will pay, you know, for the retainers, for those lawyers to represent the chairman and the movement post indictment so that we will be prepared to go to trial to fight and win. So um, I just want to say that because, you know, we are winning as, a, um, as the African People's Socialist Party says. So Uhuru Chair Jesse. Uhuru, that's absolutely right. And what the Hands Off Uhuru campaign has done is create a people's movement to fund yeah. this legal fight back, to undermine the US government and the FBI's objectives, their counterinsurgency, their goal to take Chairman Amalia Shatella and other leaders of the Uhuru movement off the streets, away from the people, to throw the whole movement into disarray and chaos, and to force the party to have to divert resources away from its programs of African working class dual power and economic development to have to pay for legal fees and other expenses. But we are here today to say that the FBI will not succeed in that goal. The African People's Socialist Party is moving forward. The African Revolution is moving forward. The Black Power Blueprint is moving forward. And our commitment is that not one cent that was planned to go towards building the capacity of the African working class to feed, clothe, and house themselves will be spent elsewhere. We, the people, will fund this legal fight back. With every dollar you donate towards the Uhuru legal defense, you are putting a handprint on a victory that will go down in history. We get to be a part of it. We will win because of the support and participation of the people under the leadership of this incredible campaign. And I'm getting a text here that it looks like, okay, we are at 2,300. So if we wanna get surpassed $3,000, that means $700 more at handsoffuhuru.org slash donate, Uhuru.
comrade. Well, um, yes, you know, and I'm just, re you know, reflecting on how today, you know, we, today's event was to honor, you know, African Martyrs Day. And what has been clear from the testimony of Comrade Jalil Muntakim and from the powerful presentations from Chairman Amali Eshetela, uh, Louise Kinshasa, and Tafari Mugheri is that the U.S. and the colonial white powers are willing to do the most horrible and unspeakable things to try to stop African people from winning, from winning our freedom. You know, including imprisoning and assassinating our leaders. We saw that in that um, in that presentation that uh, Comrade Director Akile gave. So this should be an even greater weight and urgency to our task today that we raise the funds to stop the U.S. government from attempting to do that very same thing to Chairman Omalia Shetela and the African People's Socialist Party. You know, they want to make Chairman Omalia Shetela a, 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 political, a political prisoner and, you know, who will die behind bars, which essentially, which is a death sentence. And we're not going to let that happen, right? Right. 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 <laughs> right. Because, you know, this really is like their last ditch effort to try to stop the leader of the African revolution, who they have been unable to stop for more than 60 years. And they have arrested him. They have jailed the chairman. They have harassed him. They have firebombed his house. They have raided the chair, you know, raided the Uhur house um, in 1996 with over 300 crops, slandered him and so much more. And they've never been able to stop him. So now they are desperately trying to concoct this legal basis, right, to put the chairman in prison at 81 years old with the yeah. expectation that he will die there. They want to effectively give Chairman Omalia Shetela the death penalty. And so, you know, we cannot allow one more day to go by and, and any moment indictments could drop and we would not be in place to have what we need to at least secure and defend who their target is, the chairman. That's why we have to donate today. Go to handsoffruhu.org slash donate. And not only is this making, um, <clears throat> you know, not only really like what are they doing is like making a political prisoner in like slow motion with this, you know, with these indictments and the threats of indictments, but it's an assassination in slow motion. And we will not stand by and let that happen. An attack on Chairman Amalia Shetela and the African People's Socialist Party is an attack on Africa. It's an attack on African people everywhere. And it's an attack on the liberation struggles. And by funding this fight for victory for the African People's Socialist Party, we are saying that Patrice Lumumba, that Malcolm X, that Marcus Garvey, they did not die in vain. And through our victory and their legacy, they will be vindicated and their legacies will be upheld. So that's why we say hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. And that's why we say that um, this is hands off Africa and African people and Africa's future. So please, right now, we implore you to go to handsoffuhuru.org slash, um, slash donate and, um, and make that call today. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chair Mwazi, thank you so much. That's a very powerful statement that is clearly resonating because the donations are pouring in, Chair Mwazi. People Uhuru. are going to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Fofi put in $50. Uhuru, Fofi. Uhuru, Uhuru Fofi. Julian put in $10, a huru salute to Julian. And yeah. Carl put in $100, a huru salute right to Carl. On. And Chairman Omali Ishitela and Deputy Chair Ona Zanay Ishitela have just contributed $200 towards the goal tonight. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? That means that we have raised $2,000. Yes. $660. We are so close to meeting our new goal only $340 left, $340 left to go to re reach our new goal of $3,000. We can do this. We can make this happen. Go to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. And I want to say that we are, we appreciate donations of every size. And I want to say this in particular for other white people like myself. I want to call on us to dig deep not only in terms of what money we have access to as white people based on the colonial mode of production and having access to resources dripping in the blood of stolen lives and wealth of African people, but also to dig deep in who we know, social wealth, family members, connections that we may have. We are looking for people who can donate $5,000, $10,000, $100,000, and we know that these resources are out there. And 
I want to make a call. Think about who you know. Think about what connections you might have. Think about, do you know someone? Do you know someone who knows someone that, that you could talk to, that you could arrange a meeting with, that we could develop a strategy with you to approach that person about making a serious major contribution? Because we want to go ahead and fund this thing. We want to get this behind us. And as Chair Mwazy so eloquently put it, not go another day feeling like if indictments drop tomorrow, that we don't have the resources on hand to get the legal representation in place and do what has to be done. No, we have to make sure that this is that this happens. And that's why I want to just make a call to people to uh, contact us. If you are if you know someone or know someone who knows someone or you have a connection to a foundation or a grant uh, that you want to make available to this campaign, you can put it in the chat. You can uh, contact uh, fundraising at handsoffahuru.org. We can put that in the chat. And we want to thank $5 cash from an anonymous donor in the room, Uhuru, yes. $17, $17 more from MQ, yep. and uh, $10 from Pharaoh, bringing us to 2000 692 I can't even keep up with this. $40 from Brendan, Uhuru Brendan. Yep. That means now. New title is 268 there we go. There we go. Okay. And uh, Chair Mwazy, I also want to make a call to everybody tuning in to join the fundraising team. Okay. If you want to do what we're doing right now, you want to raise money, hold events, research potential donors, help to get the word out, jump full force into raising this money, join our fundraising team. We need you on board. We need your creativity, your ideas, your enthusiasm, your commitment to fight for hands off of Huru, hands off Chairman Amalia Shatella. You can let us know in the chat, type in fund the fight back, fund the fight back. Put that in the chat. If you want to join the fundraising team, you want to hold a fundraiser, do a house event, do a bake sale, do a benefit show, or otherwise participate in this momentous and historic effort to raise the funds for this legal defense type fund the fight back in the chat and we will follow up with you about coming to our next meeting which will be held on friday march 3rd at 10 a.m central again fund the fight back to get involved in the fundraising campaign the more people we have involved in this campaign the sooner we will be able to say we did it we raised two hundred and seventy-seven thousand five hundred dollars to fund the legal defense to fund the fight for victory for the African revolution in the courts and in the streets. And this is a victory that will shake the whole world. The world will never be the same once this is over and done with. So that's my call for people to join the fundraising team. And uh, I know we're, we're running out of time, Chair Mwazy. We got right. $268 left to raise. So people can go to handsoffuru.org slash donate. I'll turn it back over to you. Uhuru. Uhuru. Well, I just wanna close this out by saying, I just wanna salute all the donors you know, any amounts. And I want to just say a big old fist up. Fight right. back. Uhuru, comrades. So we ain't, because because it's not over. It's not over. And right now we want to, uh, I just want to really appreciate you, uh, comrade uh, Chair Jesse, for just um, leading us through this powerful appeal um, and salute to the people, the people, the people. This is how we will win. So um, we are going to move right into our question and answer. And I know we are a little, um, we, we, we want to start to wrap up today's program, but we do have some questions that we are going to take. So I'm going to call up um, comrade again, um, our, our, you know, fierce comrade, Director Akile, who's um, Akile NIE, who is going to help lead us through the uh, Q&A. And we will, because um, we have some questions that we want to be able to address today. So, Uhuru comrade. Uhuru. And our chat moderators, uh, Uhuru, and our chat moderators are putting questions in the chat. Um, so just please keep those there. And if we can't get them to them all today, we, you know, uh, we will get to them in the future. Uhuru comrade. Uhuru, Uhuru Chair Mwazi and Uhuru comrades. First of all, salute the amazing fundraising efforts and to everyone who has contributed and is continuing to contribute to this fundraising goal. Um, and, you know, just recognizing the urgency and the seriousness. And I just think that Chair Mwazi did, uh, and uh, Comrade Jesse did a powerful, powerful call just now. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take a couple of the questions that have come in. And so if our panelists, Chairman Amali Chatel, I know it's late, 
um, in certain places um, and uh, where Chair, um, Comrade uh, Louise Kinshasa and Director Tafari are located. But if you are still with us, you are more than welcome to also uh, contribute to this part of the program. And uh, so this, this first question that I'm going to take was directed specifically to Comrade um, Jaleel, but also um, has been opened up uh, to all of the panelists as well. So this comrade, uh, Sarah C, I hope I got that right, says, um, could you talk about your experience at the International Anti-Imperialist Symposium and about ways in which we can build solidarity between anti-colonial movements around the world? P.S. I strongly align with your assertion that the world will not be free until Black people are free. And um, it says the first part is for Comrade Jaleel, but I would love to get the chairman's, Chair Louise's, and Chair Tafari's thoughts on the second part too. So, Uhuru. <clears throat> uh, thank you, thank you, sister, uh, for the for the comment for the for the question itself. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was invited to come myself and my my fiance uh, Valerie Hayes. We were invited to uh, to attend at the anti-imperialist uh, 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 symposium. An international anti-imperialist anti symposium on political prisoners in uh, in Greece, Athens, Greece, and so we went there for this special purpose and goal objective to ensure that they understand what our struggle is here in the United States, here in Turtle Island. And so for us, it was important for them to know that we all have political prisoners and that we are fighting for their release and and, and uh, for them to be back engaged in the struggle uh, as I have. Uh, so for us, it was important for them to know who we are, what our goals and objectives are, what our struggle it looks like, uh, because it has been a, a, a divide uh, in terms of the communication between uh, us here in the United States and other parts of, of the planet, uh, particularly Africa, uh, South America, uh, Latin America, uh, the Caribbean, and also Europe, uh, with the progressive forces in Europe. And so we were able to make, that, make those connections uh, we also made connections with uh, other uh, um, uh, progressive organizations uh, in the past, like the Red Army Brigade, uh, uh, the, the uh, Red, uh, Red Army Faction, uh, uh, the uh, uh, IRA, and uh, various other uh, revolutionary uh, uh, organizations uh, out of Europe. Uh, we were able to make a connection with them, and we continue we continue to uh, process our relationship, our working relationship uh, in that in that regard. Uh, again, I made a point, explicit point. And if you need to know, give me a send me your your your, uh, your email address, and I'll send you a copy of the uh, of the uh, my presentation uh, at that at that event in Athens, Greece. Uh, it was recorded, uh, and then you have a better understanding of what uh, the charge was. And for us, we had brought the, our entire flag, the flag uh, um, uh, at the Genocide Convention, uh, Genocide uh, International Tribunal for Genocide. We brought that flag. We hung it up. In front of the building where this forum was being held, so that the world can see that we didn't charge genocides against the U.S. or colonial government, and so that was the golden objective to put our position on the map uh, of uh, anti-imperialist movements uh, around the world, and I think we succeeded in doing so. Uhuru, Comrade Jalil, thank you for your answer and Comrade Sarah for your uh, for posing the question. And he says, thank you, or they say, thank you, Uhuru. And um, uh, if, unless Chairman or um, Chair Luwazi or Chair uh, Tafari have any, oh, I see um, Chairman on, have any comments um, regarding this particular question? Um, if not, is, we uh, is either Comrade uh, Secretary General uh, Luwazi or Director uh, Tafari, still uh, on? Yeah. Uh, no, my, uh, yeah. I'm up, but my camera is not coming on. I, I should let you know that uh, Comrade Luiz, it wasn't mentioned, he's Congo born uh, in exile, been in exile in England for a few years. So uh, go ahead, Uhuru. Yes, Uhuru, uh, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the question. Uh, if I understood it, uh, to me, uh, as African internationalists, uh, I look at a three aspect. Uh, the international question basically revolves around the main contradiction in the world between uh, uh, oppressing nations and oppressed nations. And basically it's the dividing line is around the colonial uh, question. And uh, which means that uh, all the struggles against colonialism, we have to be a part of it. And uh, when the Europeans, uh, when Europeans raise the international uh, question, 
the adults uh, mean uh, the emancipation of the oppressed uh, nations, you know, being organized by the white left, by the green, and, you know, and uh, association uh, like that. And uh, so it, it makes it really necessary for us uh, to lead on every anti-colonial question wherever uh, we are. We have to be part of it. We have to be present because, as we say throughout the discussion, we do, we do understand that colonialism as a mode of production is the bottom line. And we are the one who are saying we want a new world free from colonial mode of production. So it makes us part of every discussion to make sure opportunism does not dominate, does not permeate. So everything goes to the bottom line, you know, to the to, to the core question, to the fundamental uh, aspect of it. Another aspect, as Africans, we have the obligation to reach out to every struggle for African people everywhere. So we are we are connected, we are united, so we can go in the same direction, which again is the eradication, you know, of colonialism as a mode production. We have to remind everyone, we are not, we are not fighting against capitalism. We are fighting against colonial capitalism. You know, we want to eradicate that. And uh, the final aspect of uh, that is that not only we are fighting to eradi eradicate colonialism as a mode production, but the struggle for world socialism, we are leading it. And that's basically uh, a fundamental significance of the leadership of, of Chairman Amari. He is the one who basically makes sense for Africans to fight for world socialism. And this is consistent with uh, African culture from the beginning of uh, human, uh, humanity uh, up to now. It's consistent. We have always been a collective people. And uh, and it makes sense that we fight for a world where there will be no oppressor nation and no oppressed nation, no slave, no slave master, and, and, and things like that. So international question is really fundamental uh, for us. We have always to have our look, uh, our uh, we, we always have to have an international, uh, African internationalist outlook on every question. Every question on the planet, we need to know what's going on there and uh, you know how to move that contradiction so, so we can bring everybody to look at the core and fundamental question so that we can really be you know international so if one can become you know involved in that struggle so yeah i appreciate the question i think uh, that's what i, I can say yeah or uh, i wanted to just respond to that too in, in terms of free africa free the world is that was that part of how this discussion uh, uh, black people as it's been characterized with free Africa, free Africans and, and free the world. Unless Africa is free, nobody's gonna really be free unless black people are free. That's, that's the bottom line, not real freedom. I mean, uh, people who are opportunistically looking just to find a place in the sun on the, uh, the system uh, obviously can be free. And what typically the imperialists have done is anytime there's a crisis, they would transfer the crisis of imperialism as they characterize it onto the backs of the colonized peoples of the world. And uh, they extort more, extract more value, et cetera, uh, initiate uh, certain kinds of austerity plans uh, imposed by the IMF and World Bank uh, and other colonial powers and institutions on Africa and African people and bring more resources uh, to the United States, to Europe and what have you. And uh, but the but the U.S. and Europe they recognize this that the Africa and Black people are the critical questions, and uh, that's why uh, the, the United States declared uh, through the FBI in 1969 that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of this country. We're talking about this country. You're talking about a land uh, of settler colonizers uh, who've taken the land of the indigenous people and claimed it as their own, renamed it, renamed themselves. And then kidnapped African people here, you have the twin pillars of uh, what they call capitalism in this country rest upon the colonial, uh, uh, the, the capitalism rest in this country rest upon the twin pillars of African and, and, and indigenous uh, colonialism. Uh, and I think uh, we've seen a situation where uh, if we're not clear on this question, there are all kinds of mistakes that we make. <laughs> For example, that is to say the centrality of the colonial question, the fact that we're looking at a colonial mode of production. I was reading something not too long ago where in Stuttgart, Germany in 1907, uh, at the Communist International, the Third, uh, Third International had this conference uh, and uh, the Third International voted for socialist colonialism. 
And they, they said, how the hell uh, can we end under socialism, in colonialism, when all the resources, all the value, everything we get comes from the colonized peoples? And that they're too stupid to know what to do with it anyway. And they even made jokes like they would put us in a pot and cook us if we were in Africa with machines and stuff. This is the Communist International. And that, of course, was 1907. And I'm saying this because there's a consciousness of the centrality of the colonial question that everything that they have rests upon the foundation of colonialism and that people can envision uh, being free uh, uh, as colonizers and colonialism still being in place. There's no necessary uh, uh, connection between colonial uh, uh, fighting from their perspective against capitalism and, and fighting against colonialism. And I think that uh, further evidence of the recognition that the United States uh, understands this question of the centrality of Africa for the liberation of all the people. Um, uh, first, part of it is an attack on the African People's Socialist Party. Because one thing about the African People's Socialist Party is that uh, as an organization, we are reconnecting the whole African nation everywhere, everywhere we are, uh, similar to what Garvey did, which is the reason that the first uh, uh, integration of the FBI came as a consequence of the fact that they needed somebody black uh, to infiltrate the Garvey movement more than 100 years ago. Uh, and that you have a situation where today, for the first time in the 246 year history of the of the U.S. Marines, they made a, a, a black man, a four star general, and then put him in charge of what? Africa, uh, controlling uh, uh, Africa, maintaining Africa in this fight, in particular with black people, Africans ourselves on the continent and in the contest that the United States feels is engaged in uh, with Russia and China uh, for resources and influence in Africa. Uh, this is part of what it is that we're looking at that, that should really help us to understand uh, the significance of the, the, the reality that uh, the, the whole foundation of capitalism rests upon the backs of African people. And it's not just, just the foundation of capitalism as it relates to Black people, but it's a world economy. The entire economy is connected uh, uh, through this parasitic relationship. Every action, every activity that's happening on the globe now has at the at its center of this colonial mode of production. All life that is, is created and recreated in this process. And that and it's being troubled right now uh, because peoples around the world are fighting back, taking our resources. And of course, there's greater competition uh, now from China and Russia uh, that influences that and greater competition by a growing consciousness among African people ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, the, the FBI, when it attacked us, they, they stole 130,000 signatures that we had gathered on petitions uh, uh, online uh, around the question of, uh, of genocide. Uh, like I mentioned, in 1982, we charged the United States with genocide, convicted the United States with genocide. And this is part of what they're attacking us for now. I think it's really important to understand that and uh, to say uh, to uh, especially Comrade Jaleel that I know that we have some differences around some of these questions. And I think they're profound and deep differences, but I also think that it's possible for us to work together on some of these uh, issues and questions and how this struggle is being put forward and that we have to do that whenever and however it's possible if it doesn't come at the expense of basic and fundamental belief systems uh, or, or strategic direction uh, that either of uh, the efforts that we are making uh, 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 is involved in. Uhuru. Uhuru, if I may uh, just take one minute to, to agree uh, with uh, the chairman. Uh, he is absolutely correct. Uh, we have every method and means from which we can cooperate and build unity and the goals and justice we need to achieve. Uh, we're right. all under the suffering under the same conditions of genocide, same conditions of oppression, same conditions of white supremacy, same conditions of capitalism and imperialism. And so for us not to not find means for which we can unify and build together is betrayal of our movement, betrayal of our people. And we're not gonna do that. We will not betray our people, we will not betray our movement. And so yes, we will find the means and methods in which we can unify our organizations and unify our goals and directions, uh, um, uh, goal and direction towards this movement going forward. Uh, I, I am very grateful for, again, had an opportunity to speak uh, in, in support of the chairman uh, during this webinar. This is an important webinar, and it's important for all of us to recognize uh, uh, the extent from which we have to ensure that our comrades, who, when they're being attacked, that we defend them. And that's what we're doing here. We're defending the APSP, and we're defending our, our chairman, and we're defending the African uh, Revolution. 
I just want to say, Comrade Jalil, you have to be careful uh, because uh, uh, the, the fact is that they want us to be isolated in our movement. That's one of the reasons the international work you're doing is important. But that's also the reason they attacked us. You know, I was in Moscow. Uh, I was in Ireland. Uh, I was in various places where I was in Nicaragua uh, uh, and various places uh, like that. And so they would prefer to have us uh, isolated and separated from the international community so that they can uh, uh, define our, our situation and put forth the narrative of our reality. So be careful. And uh, uh, but I'm glad you're out there because uh, Comrade Jalil, you know, like uh, today, we say that the 1960s was a dress rehearsal, uh, that the real deal is on now. And of course, we know we're dealing with a savage beast uh, that has no shame uh, and uh, will do anything and has done anything and everything in order to maintain its domination of the world's people. So just want you to be careful and recognize that. Uh, uh, that's why I mentioned even when I understood that you had to take care of some business on a, on a you know, a quote unquote, personal level, uh, uh, because it, you know, possibly uh, involved uh, forces who want to do harm to our movement and have done that historically. So thank you, Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru, uh, Comrade Jaleel, uh, Secretary General Mwazi, and Chairman Omalia Shatella. Um, so uh, this will uh, pretty much wrap up the question and answer portion of today's program. And, you know, because we've had a very dynamic program full of powerful presentations, fundraising, and um, we do have some other questions that we are going to be looking at in the campaign and figuring out um, other forms in which they can be addressed uh, because they are great, excellent questions. Also, um, some specific uh, things that uh, we're going to be getting over to uh, you, comrade, uh, brother Jaleel. Uh, some people have requested to be able to connect with you. So we want to be able to um, facilitate that as well. So I just want to thank all of our incredible panelists and presenters for your contributions to today's program. As Brother Jaleel just said, it was a powerful and important program uh, that we just uh, carried out. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to our chair, uh, campaign chair, Comrade Mwazi. Uhuru. Uhuru, uhuru. Um, Comrade Director Akile, thank you <clears throat> for um, you know, leading the uh, really profound Q&A you know, that we just only had time for one question and we just un opened up so much just in that. So I just really want to just salute and appreciate this entire program. And um, before I move on, I just want to um, just salute some more donations that just came in. And um, I want to really want to appreciate uh, Kimberly for your $20 donation. And, um, and then another donation that a, a pledge that was finally, you know, a pledge that was made a reality so that now we are at $248 left to go to meet our goal. We have total, we have raised a total of $2,752 in this webinar on today by the power of the people. So I just want to give everybody just a round of applause, but we're not there yet and we will get there, um, you know, make a pledge and we will make that goal today. And I do, yes, the struggle continues. Uhuru, um, thank you, Howard, who just put that in the chat. And I just want to, before I move on to our announcements, I just, um, <clears throat> and turn it over to the chairman for closing words. And we want to take a group picture too. So um, just want to say that too, for everybody who's still on, but I just really want to salute um, all of our presentations. I want to really appreciate Director Keeley for that opening up with that really powerful um, presentation, um, you know, PowerPoint presentation. I want to appreciate um, Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, um, Director Tafari, um, you know, Chair of the African Pe People's Socialist Party in uh, Occupy Designia, leading the hands off Uhuru um, with SU Louise with this entire um, hands-off international global um, you know um, fight back I want to really want to appreciate um, brother Jalil Muntakim for being here on today for continuing this struggle and 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 um, this won't be the last um, and and the next time will be even more powerful because we're going to continue to fight back so I just want to really appreciate you for making it on this call and chairman for your relentless struggle um, that has brought us here today. Um, we had the example of Marcus Garvey uniting African people from all over the world, and we can see that example in Chairman Amalia Shatella um, throughout your your relentless leadership. And and you know we are going to we're going to make it, and we're going to see African people united and living the life that we were meant to live, which means that all human beings in all walks of life will live the life that we were meant to live um, in this lifetime. So Uhuru and um, 
I see that Diane has made a pledge to do $20. That This is in the Zoom chat for um, those who can't see who are um, on the back end. So thank you, uh, thank you, Diane, for that pledge. Um, that is just great. And that is just what we need. Continue to make the pledge so that we can um, get up there. So right now that takes us to um, $228 left to, um, you know, remaining to raise for today. So we're going to go right into our announcements and our chat moderators are ready to drop all these links in the chat. So I'm going to move quickly. Um, <clears throat> but I want to, um, as that slide pulls up, if you have not already followed us um, on social media, um, and that slide probably says something wrong, but it should say follow us on social media. Okay. Um, you can go to um, at sign hands off Uhuru. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram, on TikTok. Follow our pages. Help us get our um, get our followers up. You know, we have our website, but this is just another way to engage with with, with the communities that have been built. So um, go to um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok and find us there. And we have some great content creators that are putting out amazing videos and clips of all these webinars so that you can share them out with the people. So next one, we want you to, again, go to um, handsoffuhuru.org slash um, petition and sign the petition. I want to appreciate those who have been sending in pictures of your um, of your paper petitions. This shows that the people are out there on the ground getting petitions for um, for this fight bag. And again, we will talk more about what, about what we will do with this petition. But for now, let's get the petition signed. You can do that online or you can print off a copy of the petition on our outreach tab um, um, on our website. Next slide. We want to um, um, encourage everybody to know that you can host an event. You can help build this 2023 tour of the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa counter offensive. Email info at Uhuru Tours. Um, you know, uh, the calendar is, as we say, already booking up. But if you are interested in helping to build the tourist committee or you want to volunteer on the tourist committee to help us organize these, these tours, you can email um, the campaign as well. Uhuru. All right, and uh, next one. This Tuesday, um, the International Organizing Committee, so you just heard from Secretary General Louise, you just heard from Director Tafari, they are organizing a webinar on Tuesday, February 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern um, and 7 p.m. Uh, uh, GMT London time and 9.30 South Africa time. And this is an event to commemorate the International Month of African Martyrs um, from Cameroon to IET. Um, we will have the chairman, uh, Chairman Amalia Chatella, and other very special speakers on this call. Um, you will hear some of us try our best to speak French, to speak to the people, and we want you to be there. So register. You can go to tinyurl.com slash hou 28 FEV, which means February, February, February in French. So um, our chat moderators just put that in the chat. Thank you so much. Next, we want to invite everybody to sign up for the next Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa volunteer orientation. This will be on March 10th. Um, you can register by going to tinyurl.com slash H-O-U-N-U. And um, you can do that by, um, you know, go ahead and do that, sign up and learn how you can help join this counteroffensive. We need many different types of positions filled, secretaries, event planners, people to create content. Um, all your creativity, all your skills belong in this campaign, in this fight back. As we say, the highest form of unity is organization. So help us and come and get organized with us. All right, next one. Go to handsoffuhuru.org slash shop and get some of the Hands Off merch. Again, some of you might be getting these because of your donations, but if you want to just rock one anyways while you're out there in the streets, go to handsoffuhuru.org and get you some Uhuru swag. Uhuru. And this was mentioned earlier in case you missed it. You can, um, the, our chat moderators will, will put this in the chat, but we had a really powerful in the Midwest region, hands off Uhuru, hands on the mic poetry event. And I just couldn't go another week without letting the people know that this was powerful. Um, so please uh, check that out in the chat and you can go and watch that. That happened live last time, uh, uh, last weekend in um, on the ground in St. Louis at the Uhuru house in Aquaba Hall. And for all your news and analysis, Visit handsoffuhuru.org. You will see um, media, our news and analysis, old, you know, um, interviews that have taken place. This is the place where where um, where we are centering in on providing the ideological and political leadership for this struggle. So go to handsoffuhuru.org. And if you need to contact the campaign, you can just even take a screenshot of this picture here. But there, our chat moderators will put this in the chat. 
we, you can call us, you can go to our website, you can email us. We want to make ourselves available to you. So um, contact us. And thank you those who contacted us during tonight's webinar asking, how can I donate? I'm having trouble. This is what we want. Use us, use us, use us. And as we say, hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. And I'm going to turn it over to the chairman um, to close us out. And again, um, we want all of our speakers to, if you can, at some point, come on camera before we close. Um, but again, just really want to salute today's powerful program. Uhuru. So, Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, thank you so much, Comrade. Uh, I think uh, most of what needs to be said has been said. I want to, again, express appreciation to you, Comrade Mwazi, uh, and the people who are responsible for really conducting this more or less seamless uh, process. Um, that you've just done. And I want to express appreciation also uh, uh, to the leadership of the Hands Off Uhuru uh, uh, Committee, uh, to also the uh, unindicted co-conspirators, my, my co-unindicted co-conspirators. I, I want to salute you, express my deep and profound appreciation. I, I know the terror uh, that was experienced on July 29th. And I know that it's something that is not intended to go away, which is why they have characterized us as unindicted uh, co-conspirators because to be unindicted uh, does, denies us like legal standing so that you can even go into a courtroom and say, hey, uh, I want this to stop because there's nothing done officially and formally up to now. And so every day uh, we've been expecting indictments. In fact, uh, thought it would have happened by now, could happen any minute, in fact, and it could happen in any form, similar to what they just did. It could do another no knock like they did with Fred Hampton, like they did with us, uh, like they did with many of the, uh, the Panther 21. And uh, so I, I really you know, appreciate uh, uh, you comrades for your courage and, and the number of people who've uh, uh, interestingly have joined or tried to join the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement precisely because they saw us attacked uh, by the FBI, which is really interesting. The number of people said, this is not just in the United States, by the way, this is in Africa and other places said, this is why I want to join. And uh, interestingly, uh, when we were being held handcuffed and zip tied uh, on 44 Redbud uh, uh, on July 29th here in St. Louis, the uh, FBI uh, guy in charge wanted to make it known to us that this is going to be the news. You're going to be in the news, et cetera, uh, in a very braggadocia kind of way. And I think that uh, whatever their intentions are, uh, is they gave us a larger platform that we've ever had and let people know we're here and that we're fighting back and it's possible to fight back. And the Black Revolution is not dead, that they didn't kill it with Malcolm and Martin Luther King and the arrest of Sundiata and Jalil and chasing Asada uh, into exile or what have you. It still exists and people want it to be a part of it. And that's really important. And this, this forum that we've done today is extremely important. It's a part of the entire process that we're engaged in to expose very clearly the fallacy of this notion that somehow Russians have to tell us that we are oppressed, that there has never been a time where we were not trying to end this oppression. Only way they've been able to get away with it up to now in this last period is they killed off and jailed revolutionaries because of a counterinsurgency that imposes the neo-colonial forces in our community posing as leaders, uh, not just in this country, but around the world, wherever Africans are, you see they put neo-colonial forces who haven't made any kind of criticism of the social system. But that's backfiring as we see. As we see, they can't even get neo-colonial stooges on the continent of Africa to unite with them in terms of what they are saying and what they're trying to impose on, 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 on them, uh, uh, the narrative they're trying to impose on the world in terms of the Russia-Ukraine question. All of that's falling apart and people can see them and we can see them. And they announced to the world that this is the FBI, come out with your hands up and your hands empty they used loud noises so that my whole community was awakened. The objective is to terrify them. And they've simply alerted the people, just as we are doing right now, uh, that the struggle lives, that struggle continues, and, and that we are engaged in this counteroffensive that we call the Defense Committee. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Comrade Jalil. Uh, I think I know some of the things, the bad, bad things they did to you when they captured you. 
Now that doesn't get talked about. I've never heard you talk about it. And, and you know, but I, I, I know they did horrible things to you and to other comrades uh, uh, as well. So uh, I just wanna thank you and thank you for your courage because I know there's always this threat. I know how that immediately after you got out, they tried to put you back. They tried to put you back in prison. Uh, and so there's this threat that's always out there. This is a form of terrorism uh, that exists all the time. And uh, so I wanna appreciate you and I want everybody to appreciate you uh, uh, as well. So thank you, thank you brothers and sisters. Thank you comrades. Uh, again, thank Hands Off Uhuru uh, Committee. Uh, hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. Uhuru. Yeah. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, yeah. comrade. Yes, right on. We appreciate you, comrade uh, Jalil, and you've seen that in the chat. And I hope, don't forget to save the chat because there's just a lot of outpouring of support, um, you know, in the chat as well. So um, those who can come on camera, let's come on, let's get our screenshot and let's, let's, let's show them what the, you know, what the fight back looks like uh, live and in color. And I want to appreciate comrades and thank you, Chairman, for your closing um, remarks and just for your relentless leadership. Uhuru. So we're going to say hands off Uhuru. Hands up, hands up, fist up, fight, fight, fight. All right, Uhuru. Easy way to Africa. Africa. Easy way to Uhuru. Uhuru.